convention. I will wait the 15 seconds just to make sure that the live stream starts okay. And here we are actually live. Excellent. Okay. So this is uh, London Bit Devs. Uh, this is a Scratch seminar. We've already had two events last week, so uh, um, it's, it's great to see so many on the call. I wondered if there'd be uh, uh, lethargy after two last week, but they were both great. Uh, videos are up, transcripts are up on uh, Bitchnor and Tim Ruffin's presentation. Um, the, tra oh, the transcript for Tim Ruffin's presentation isn't up yet, but it will be up. Uh, but today, it will be CoinSwap. So CoinSwap has been in the, in the news quite a bit because uh, Productions just got from the Human Rights Foundation to work on it, and there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm. And at least uh, a couple of people on the call really been getting used to coin swaps. Uh, there's a couple of the Wasabi guys that have been talking about coin swaps in the Wasabi Reading Club. Uh, so let's try and get started as soon as we can. Um, what do I need to say? Yeah, this is being live streamed. Uh, this is on, there's a call currently on Jitsi. Uh, Jitsi is free, open source, doesn't collect your data. Um, there will be a transcript, but it can be anonymized and it can be edited. So please don't let that put you off. Um, yeah, the, 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 this is an exercise to try and find gotchas. So this is purely for educational reasons. Um, and, yeah, apart from that, I think that's everything. Uh, there is a paste bin up. I've shared it in YouTube. Uh, everyone on the call should be aware of it. We'll, we'll go through the resources on that paste bin just to get structured the, to the discussion. Um, but as is normal, we'll do intros for anybody that wants to do an intro. Um, there is a hand signal in the bottom left of your screen. So if you want to do an intro, um, basically uh, who you are, uh, what interest or what level of understanding you have on coin stocks, um, and you don't have to give your real name if you don't want. Uh, please turn the video on when you are participating if you're happy to have the video on, um, but turn the sound and the video off when you're not participating. Um, but having the video on when you're participating is better for the live stream. Okay, so can I have a hand or two and we'll do introductions? Not seeing any hands. Uh, bottom of the screen, there's a hand signal. Uh, let's go to Adam. Hi, Adam Gibson. Um, I uh, have some knowledge of CoinSwap because I, I did an implementation of it called CoinSwap CS a couple of years ago. And I, I also corrected Greg Maxwell's <laughs> 2013 um, protocol which I don't think many people know. <laughs> I also am the author of the diagram you have at the top of your, your page. <laughs> anyway, that's my claim. Hopefully, claim. You, won't see me for co Hopefully <laughs> you won't see me for copyright. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, it sounds like a mischievous laugh. Okay, thanks for, thanks for that, Adam. Uh, great to have you on the call. Uh, anybody else? We've got quite a few people on the call. Anyone else want to do an intro? Uh, let's go to Max. Yeah, so Max Silverbrand here. Hi. Um, building on different Bitcoin uh, tools, currently focusing a lot on privacy, specifically on chain with Wasabi Wallet, uh, but also have been thinking about coin joins, uh, sorry, coin swaps uh, for quite a while. Uh, and uh, I was very excited about the promises of uh, Schnorr and uh, scriptless scripts and adaptive signatures. And I'm even more excited that all of this is becoming possible with Schnorrless ECDSA. Uh, or 2P ECDSA. Uh, so this is this is quite nice. Cool. Thank you, Max. Uh, anybody else? Let's go to OpenNums. Hi, you know you know me and OpenNums as this blue robot. I'm usually just contributing to the Dress Publicity project, which is like a Lightning Network nodes implementation and uh, a lot else. Uh, recently, was working on putting or like kind of integrating join markets on it and then I've been working on a little terminal based menu called a uh, join inbox project which is just helping the uh, join market cli um, usage so 
I'm generally very enthusiastic about uh, privacy on Bitcoin and uh, you know, excited what the coin swap proposal has uh, to offer as well. Great, thanks, Abenoms. Anybody else? Not seeing any hands. Give five seconds. Oh, no, there is a hand. Uh, Aviv, let's get to Aviv. Hey, everyone. I can't hear you. I... Hello. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Aviv. Uh, I am uh, Health the Wasabi Research Club alongside with uh, Max. And um, I'm really into privacy. Say, uh, um, one thing I'm really proud of, I got to interview Gibson for his work on not to, uh, not to go. I uh, to curve math, which was great. So I'm kind of a big deal. So, yeah, leave it at that. I, we, we had most of that, but the connection wasn't great. So maybe uh, uh, maybe if we uh, keep the video off next time, I don't know if that will help. But we heard most of that. So thanks thanks for the intro. Uh, great to have you here. Anybody else? I'm not seeing any hands. I just see the chat. OK, I'm not seeing any other hands. OK, so as is custom in the previous Socratics, we kind of start from basics. Um, so I'll just throw out a basic question out there. Um, what is what is an atomic swap first? So what is it? What's, what is an atomic swap trying to achieve? And this has been discussed for years um, in terms of swapping coins between chains. But can anybody explain how how a traditional conventional atomic swap works and what it's trying to achieve? Let's have some hands. Otherwise, I'll pick someone. Let's go to Max. So a swap specifically or generally is about uh, changing the property rights titles. You're a bit quiet, Max. Could you, uh, could you go towards the microphone or turn the volume up? You're a bit uh, quiet. Oh, yes. How about now? Is it better? Uh, yeah, it's better. Thanks. OK, cool. Sorry. Uh, so a swap is about exchanging property right titles, very generally speaking. Um, so there are two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice has something, Bob has something else, and now they want to have the thing that the other person has. And so they swap it uh, and, and they exchange it. Um, what makes this whole thing atomic, um, not in the sense that it's small, but in the sense that uh, it, is, it is binary. Uh, either the trade happens or it does not happen. Meaning either Alice gets the good of Bob and Bob gets the good of Alice, or nothing happens at all and both uh, retain their own goods themselves. Uh, and the cool thing is, this means that nobody can steal. Uh, it is basically a, uh, a bulletproof um, property rights exchange contract, uh, so to speak. Um, there's no possibility that Alice can have both her own good and the good from Bob. Um, this is not possible in this scheme. And it's achieved by utilizing well, brilliant cryptography and uh, also Bitcoin script. Uh, in order to enforce this uh, with some timing constraints that I'm sure we will talk about. Uh, but this is probably a, a rough um, explanation. Thanks, Max. Uh, any additions from anybody else? Not seeing any hands. Yeah, okay. Just we'll move on. Uh, so, okay, go for it. Yeah, no, it's just uh, the go for word, open names. The word atomic means that it is all or nothing, which has uh, you know Max, Max, Max described that there is no way that uh, uh, the trade goes halfway forward and not all the way. So there is only oh, it, it's all or nothing. So that's why we call it atomic. It might it might be worth mentioning that that uh, that, uh, that the achievement of that goal is contingent on trusting that the blockchains, so to speak, clock operates correctly. So, for example, no reorgs 
or, or no deep reorgs, depending on how you set it up. So it's not like you get the atomicity for free. It's it's sort of depending on the blockchain behaving itself. And you could say the same about Lightning, right? It's basically the same same yes. solutions. Yes, because it's the same kind of primitive involved in uh, at least one aspect of the Lightning network. Yeah, similar. Okay. Anything else on atomic swaps? Um, any beginners on the call? Does everyone understand what an atomic swap is? Can I? I mean, certainly. Can, can I elaborate on that a little bit? Can you hear me? Go for it. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yeah, Bob McElrath. Um, so there's a fun theorem that says atomic swaps are impossible without a trusted third party, um, and so we don't get away from that theorem here. Um, the two assets live on two different blockchains, presumably. Uh, so one solution to this problem is to put them both on the same blockchain, which is basically the way all ERC-20 swaps work by putting them on the same blockchain. Uh, what Bitcoin does is use a, a two interleave time locks. So it's not actually atomic in that it doesn't happen at one point in time. Um, one swap has to go forward and then the second one has to follow, but there's a back out um, that both parties, if the other half of the transaction doesn't go through, the other half um, can re retrieve their coins and, and affect the uh, the other half, the, the non-execution of the swap. Uh, thanks. What was that theory you... Uh, yeah, sorry, go for it, Max. Uh, I, I have a, a follow-up question here. Um, for, for one more bit on this theory that it is impossible. Uh, and then the, the second part of the question, is there a difference between swapping between things, like Bitcoin to Litecoin, uh, and then compared to swapping on the same chain, uh, Bitcoin UTXOs on the base layer. If the base layer mediates the uh, atomicity, right, and the atomicity happens on the base layer, and that there are actually two transactions that are confirmed simultaneously, and they can only be confirmed simultaneously, then the base layer is enforcing atomicity, right? So you, in order to do that, you have to have a base layer that supports multiple assets. And that, that is what's done on many of the blockchains out there that have uh, that support sub assets, if you will, and the whole DeFi thing. And Alex has written in the chat. Uh, he's written a high level overview on HDRCs for beginners who are interested in the escrow mechanism uh, behind atomic swaps. Alex, do you want to say anything about that? Or are you happy? Yeah, I guess just at a high level, HTLCs kind of function as a uh, escrow with a time lock so that, you know, once you put money into the escrow, it'll either execute successfully based on certain conditions or refund the payer once the time lock has expired. Um, HTLCs also underlie or are, are one of the primitives used in the Lightning Network. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the potential for HTLCs just seems boundless <laughs> in my opinion and ptlc's we'll get on to that later um nothing much says in the chat is that due to the fisher lynch patterson impossibility or is it something specific to these swaps i think that's a question to mm, bob i think that i think that sounds right Google it. okay but yeah this statement is true it, it doesn't necessarily apply only to cryptocurrencies. It also applies to anything else in the world, including PDF files, uh, physical objects, um, anything else. Uh, there, there, you absolutely can't exchange anything, electronic or otherwise, without a trusted third party. Yeah, it's, it is on, as, as I was saying in the chat, it's usually referred to as fair exchange. So the title of the paper was On the Impossibility of Fair Exchange Without a Trusted Third Party. But it's the same thing. Yeah, so in the blockchain space, we outsource the third party in a couple different ways. You know, so one interesting way is, you know, in the case of like Ethereum with ERC-20 tokens, uh, the blockchain is actually mediating and it's the rules of the blockchain that enforce the atomicity. Um, there are ways to trust minimize that trusted third party. The whole state chains conversation is an example of a trust minimized third party, but it is, a, it's, it is still a trusted third party that enforces atomicity. Um, and of course, for HCLCs, we use the time locks. Yeah, that, that's, okay. why I was, that's, why I was, that's why I was saying at the beginning is like the, the simplest way to understand it perhaps is just, just 
we're, we're, what the trade-off is we're, we're trusting that the blockchain clock is is behaving as we intend it to in our time locks but yeah there's a lot of different things you could say about this we've we've said a lot already <laughs> Okay, let's move on to the first item on the reading list. So I think everyone on the call should have the pace bin. Let me just uh, put it in the chat in case you haven't. Uh, and I've posted it on YouTube. Uh, so as is custom for these like historical timeline exercises, the first link is a Bitcoin talk post by Greg Maxwell. Let me share my screen. Okay. Getting confused with how Zoom and okay. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen. Okay, so the first item on the reading list is this Greg Maxwell uh, post on coin swap. Um who would like to discuss this? So this is like at the idea phase back in 2013, and obviously lots has changed since then. But the the foundation of the crux is kind of here. But I think is I think so, uh, it's it's not as trust minimized as some of the designs today. Is that correct? Um, who wants to go through this post? Put your hands up. Press that hand. I mean, from what I remember, it's kind of complicated to say the least, but it's um, it's not less trust minimized. It's the same basic thing. It's just that he t he, he chose to present it, perhaps perhaps logically, I don't know, um, in, in the form of a three-party protocol rather than a two-party. But but in a sense, we, we, we're kind of missing a step because I think people usually refer back to a Tier Nolan post from a little bit earlier when they first talked about atomic swaps. And this, this was uh, Greg specifically introducing the concept that even on a single blockchain, it could be a very useful construct to have this kind of atomic swap in order to preserve privacy. And he was trying to explain how you could do that without um, basically do the atomic swap but with, without revealing the contract on, on chain. That's the most important concept that's being played out there. But it, it is a little complicated uh, the way it's presented there. I, I, I couldn't explain it to you right now. It was years ago I looked at this. I, as I said, I did actually find a mistake in it. <laughs> it was quite funny telling Greg of that. <laughs> <laughs> because he wasn't too pleased, but but it was, it's a minor thing. Because even if there was no mistake in that protocol I've laid out, it was it was written before uh, there was such a thing as uh, CLTV and CSV. So check lock time verify and check sequence verify were. Oh, you're going to test me now. But I, when when did that activate? Maybe 2016 or something. But anyway, it was years after this. Um, so he's writing like how to do it with time locks on back out contracts rather than sort of integrating it into one script and as i say also it's three party which makes it more complicated but anyway it's a complicated story maybe somebody else has more details so this was before time locks oh i didn't do that. They may well and have been proposed this, at this stage, but they weren't. They weren't in the, in the in the code or, or or activated. Well, there there was a lock time in the original Bitcoin, as and as you said, the CSV um, soft fork, which happened in 2016, uh, added the check lock time verify um, and the check sequence verify opcodes, and that's really what gave us HTLCs. The original time lock that was in Bitcoin didn't behave in a way that anybody expected. Um, it, it was not really very useful. Right, thanks for that. Yeah, you're right, of course, yeah. And then this party Carol in the middle, there is no trust in Carol? What, how, why, what is the point of Carol if there is no, no trust required in Carol in this scheme? I mean, you, I, I actually haven't read this for like four years, and it's or three years at least. Um, so I'd have to, I'd have to read it. It's very long and very complicated. I'm, I'm sorry. If somebody else has read this in detail recently, <laughs> maybe they can tell you. I'm not sure about this specific proposal, but generally the third party is added to enforce atomicity, and you can minimize trust down to only enforcing atomicity and not knowing anything else. 
Okay, cool. And towards the end of Greg's post, he gives this comparison to CoinJoin. That was quite interesting. Um, yeah, but but hang on, hang on. I mean, if, even if you just look at like the introductory s statements at the front, of the, at the top of the diagram, phase zero sets up the escrows and the timeout refunds. Phase one makes it so that if Bob gets paid, there is no way for Carol to fail to get paid. So, in other words, I, I mean, yeah, of, of course there are such things as escrows with trust, but I, th I don't think there's anything interesting here in regard to like having trusted parties. This is about enforcing atomicity at the, at the, at the at the transaction level the, the only reason the only reason it's different from like a cltv type construct is that you have to use these like extra transactions with with time locks in the end lock time at, 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 as backouts um um i'm pretty sure it's just a bit irritating to me because i can't sit down and read this now for like 20 minutes and figure it out again but i'm pretty sure this isn't about like having a trusted relationship that's, that's what i wanted to say Okay, thank you. And then you mentioned, uh, Adam, the Tier Nolan scheme. So that's this one. So this is May 2013. When was Greg's? October 2013. Yeah, so it was before Greg's. Um, again, I, th I think I'm going to be leading on Adam and uh, Bob potentially here, but uh, could you explain the Tier Nolan scheme and how it Def varied, definitely not how it differs? Okay. Definitely not me because I never understood it. I remember reading it about three or four times and never quite understanding what was going on. Probably best okay. to just skip to directly to how HTLCs work today and time locks there. Uh, the other reference I would point out on this in, you know, and there are probably lots of people on the call that can explain HTLCs better than I can. The other reference I would point out would be um, Sharon Goldberg's talk from the MIT Bitcoin Expo which uh, this year, which enhances the Tier Nolan proposal and adds three time locks. Uh, which adds the, um, the feature that either party can go first. Tier Nolan's proposal has to have one party going first. Um, but broadly, there's two time locks. Um, there's a window of time in which if Alice goes first, she can get her coins back. Um, and uh, if, Bob doesn't, if Bob doesn't go, if Bob does go, everything's good. We have, it's executed. Um, so there are two time, time locks there. Maybe somebody wants to explain the, HTLCs from the Lightning community. Just, just so the motor scheme was the same motivation, like today. It was a as far as I understand. The Nolan scheme was to do between different currencies. Is that correct? I lost you completely, Michael. I don't know if it was just me. But you you were just cutting out most of the time. Okay, let me repeat. Um, the motivation for Greg's scheme was the same motivation as Chris Belcher's point in privacy technique. While the Tier Nolan was set up to do atomic swaps, so a swap between two cryptocurrencies. Is that correct? Let's go to nothing much. I think nothing much is hand up. Uh, so uh, hopefully, I, I think my connection is also very poor, but hopefully you can hear me. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, the history is as follows. First, there was the a bitter to better paper by uh, Elaine Shi and others, which introduced the idea. Uh, I linked that in the chat earlier. It introduced the idea of using swaps, uh, using uh, hash locks and time lock transactions, uh, and a multi-sig for privacy. I believe Tier Nolan came after and generalized that to do swaps between different blockchains. Uh, and then uh, the Greg's uh, coin swap uh, post describes uh, essentially the same thing as um, uh, an atomic swap between two parties on Bitcoin specifically for uh, privacy. Um, a minor correction for earlier is that Carol is just whoever Alice wants to pay. Carol doesn't know she's participating in a coin swap, so she's like a passive recipient. Uh, and it's typically meant to be Alice herself. The reason he added it is to emphasize that um, you can also send payments from a coin swap without uh, an intermediate step. Uh, and I think the main innovation from a privacy point of view 
uh, in the coin swap post over the previous protocols is that um, the 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 whole notion of a cooperative um, uh, path where the only on-chain footprint is uh, the multi-sig output. So none of the hash uh, 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 lock contracts actually make it uh, unless one of the parties defects and the refund is actually used, uh, which is why it was a substantial improvement to privacy. Um, I hope that's accurate, but that's that's my recollection. Yeah, that, that sounds really good. Can, and, and maybe maybe it nicely kind of illustrates that while it's natural to go down a historical route in this, it might actually be more, it might actually be better sort of educationally to just look at those two basic ideas. Like maybe first we could actually mechanically state how an atomic swap con construct works without any privacy concerns. And then we could describe as nothing much just said and as Greg uh, laid out and is, as is in many future developments, we can lay out how you take that basic construct and you just overlay a certain thing on it and it makes it work for privacy. That would maybe maybe make sense. Okay, so in kind of direction there, uh, like just it's or top. certainly the impression I gave is what I was the last uh, few years is that the use case of swapping currencies between chains has been focused on in state forty eight twenty nineteen case. So I want to explain how do mix between between chains? Um, let's do that. Uh, does anybody want to explain how an atomic swap works? So it's basically the HDC concept, at least today. Uh, I can I, I can, can, I can, I can just go through the basic. Open arms, please explain the H. Oh, okay. No, no, go for it, Adam. It's better to have okay, volunteers so I can than force arms. Okay, so I can just explain the uh, best I can the, the most basic uh, atomics. It's pretty complicated, isn't it, really? But at, at its base, it's simple because the basic idea of a, an atomic swap, at least as we've done it up till now, uh, was always this idea of a hash pre-image that that um, basically you you get one side pays to a script which um, uh, which can only be um, spent out of by revealing a hash pre-image and uh well in fact let's say both both recipients so two people are like exchanging coins for whatever reason whether it be cross blockchain or the same blockchain and um they're both able to sort of extract the two chunks of coin if they reveal the hash pre-image now one of them starts off with an advantage in, in that he knows that the, the, the hash pre-image so if he did it in a naive way, he could just claim the coins himself uh, and then try and claim the other ones too. But, but the basic idea, of course, is that when you broadcast a transaction that reveals a hash pre-image, and you know, the script says something like, uh, check if the whatever data you put in there when hashed equals this previously agreed hash uh, output. But the, the, of course, the, the basic idea is that because you have to broadcast it in order to claim the coins, that means that that pre-image, that hash pre-image by, by definition becomes public. And so in a sort of naive way to do it, then then like Alice would have the hash pre-image, would try to claim one of the outputs using the hash pre-image. And then the naive idea would be that Bob would see that hash pre-image on the blockchain because it was published inside the, the script sig of the, of the transaction that Alice used to, uses to claim. And he would take that hash pre-image and then effectively just do the same thing. He would take that hash pre-image and, and construct construct a script sig, you know, a, a valid uh, script sig for, for the other uh, output. And so he gets his one coin. I suppose they're, they're both trying to uh, claim one coin. Um, so that the, obviously the problem with that is that the it doesn't have the security that you want because... Alice is in this preferential situation where she knows how to claim both of the coins because she knows both of the hash pre-images. So you add um, another layer to it. You, you add um, 
that only one party can claim uh, by adding the requirement of signing against the public key. Uh, and then there's more to it than that because I haven't really thought about this for a while, but there's more to it than that because uh, the, why do we need timeouts? Because if you think about it, the, the, if, if, if you had, had this set up just as I described it, where both sides would claim uh, the coins if they know the pre-image to a hash, but also it was locked to one of their keys, that it looks kind of secure, but then you have a deadlock problem because um, if if the first party refuses to um, reveal the hash pre image, the one that knows it, then because you've had to deposit coins into these scripts, uh, then the coins are locked up until that person decides to reveal it, or maybe they die, or maybe they just disappear. So then your money is dead. So you do need a back out. And so then the question becomes, how does each side um, have a back out to ensure safety against the other party misbehaving? And then finally, so I haven't actually explained that in full detail, but I'm sure we will at some point. But And then uh, the last point, and this is maybe the most important point, is if you do that, oh, maybe we, we're going to talk about this later as well. How do we convert it into a private form? So, I mean, in, in talking about this, you might or might not, I don't know, you might find the diagram at, at, on Michael's meetup page to be useful in this. In, in that case, we've got Alice and Carol and TX0 and TX1 on that diagram show uh, Alice and Carol respectively funding a two of two. And why do they fund a two of two? Because they need to um, have joint control of, of the funds. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of waffling at this point. Does anyone want, else want to pick this up and maybe like correct or add in details I missed out? I'm not seeing any hands. I mean, one uh, thing. One yeah, thing go just, on. Yeah. Go, go, go for it, Adam. No, one I'm not. Thing I, I, one thing I saw going through like some of these like resources and atomic swaps yeah apparently sergio damien lerner had an attempt back in 2012 with a trustless exchange protocol called p2p tradex ah, and this and that was the idea actually, that was refined yeah. and formalized by tin o tin nolan in 2013 that rings a bell yeah i've got a vague memory of that yeah because uh but maybe and we should the guys at d sorry yeah the guys at Decred worked on 2014 uh, executing atomic swap with Litecoin. I oh, know that's 2017. Yeah, that makes more sense. So um, it's certainly most of most of the activity is swapping currencies between chains. It seems. I, I just, I just, I just, I just realised that I've, I've, I've really haven't helped in, in the description I just did there because, because really the first thing we need to really get clear is as people have been saying, HTLC. Now, HTLC I think is a slightly unfortunate name. I mean, obviously it's correct name but it's not a very kind of intuitive name. So forget all this stuff about coin swaps for a minute and just really focus in on this idea that you could have a custom script that had had those two, um, that had either, um, it pays out if you provide a hash pre-image or it pays out after a, a, after a delay, right? And why do we want the after a delay clause? Obviously, because you don't want to pay into a hash pre-image. Uh, you don't want to pay into a hash. So we're talking about something where the script says, check if the data provided in the script sig hashes to this value. Yeah, uh, We don't want just to pay into some a script like that uh, and then just have it like sitting there infinitely because the other party walked away, right? So the concept of back out is absolutely crucial. So that's why the time lock in hashed time lock contract exists. As well as paying into a, a hash, we're, pay, we're paying into that or uh, uh, something that's locked in times, let's say 100 blocks forward or 1,000 blocks forward or possibly time instead. So hash time not contract refers to that. So you could think of hash time not contract as one specific kind of Bitcoin script. I seem to remember actually at one point, some people actually tried to produce a BIP to standardize this. But actually the only kind of standardization is, well, in certain places like in Lightning. So anyway, you've got such a script and that's cool. But, it, but the idea of atomic swap is that you sort of lock together two such scripts. BIP 199, you're correct. You lock together two such scripts um, 
It could be on different blockchains. So it could be you know, Litecoin and Bitcoin, for example, or it could be on the same blockchain. And this, this again, forgetting privacy entirely, the idea would be that both Alice and Bob have such a script, or rather both Alice and Bob pay into such a script. Uh, Alice pays into the first one. It says, well, this script releases the coins if you provide the pre-image of the hash, or it releases without the hash pre-image after 100 blocks. And then Bob does the same, and he they use the same hash uh, uh, output in the in the in the in the script the hash value so to speak in the script, but they use slightly different time locks. So if you think of it as like trading, perhaps um, uh, Alice is paying into one uh, that that is on is on Bitcoin, you know, like one Bitcoin and Litecoin one is a hundred Litecoin. The idea is it should be atomic in the sense that if let's say uh, Bob receives one Bitcoin and Alice receives 100 Litecoin, that if one of them happens, both should happen. And the idea is that because when one of them happens, it gets broadcast onto the, to the chain with the hash pre-image, then the other one per force should be able to be broadcast also. That's, that's the most core concept. And the time locks exist to make sure that both parties are never in danger of putting their coins into such a such a script, but never getting them out again. Maybe that's the simplest explanation you can give for an atomic swap, maybe. I, th I think I would, sus I suspect most people will know what HDLC is, but it's just, it's a HDLC in one direction, HDLC going in the other direction, right? Uh, with a link between those two HDLCs. Yeah, I'm not sure about the directionality issue. Like, if you were, if you're thinking about HDLC in a Lightning context, then obviously we've got a chain of them and not just two, right? But I think it's basically the same thing. It's like if one transaction is broadcast, the other one can also be broadcast. It's just that it's only two and not three, four, five, or however in a in a Lightning uh, path. That was an interesting question in the chat. So, so this is talking about two different cryptocurrencies but the question is moving value from a legacy address to a batch 32 so you're kind of I mean, this is i suppose this is going in the direction of like chris belcher's tops but like you're swapping coins in a legacy address for coins in a batch 32 and your counterparty is getting the old and this is where alex said it's been nine nine yeah yeah he's yeah he was right he was he was he was explaining what I was saying earlier more, more correctly. He was pointing out exactly which BIP number it is. But anyway, I don't think you should focus on, on that legacy BIP32 thing yet. I think that's not where we are right now. But perhaps nothing much has something to add. Your, 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 your audio is fine, nothing much, by the way. Don't worry. Uh, I, I have nothing more to add on top of what you just said. <laughs> Does everyone understand what an atomic swap is? Does anyone like not see? Okay, so what's okay? Here's a concept check question, right? When when you're a teacher, you have to have concept check questions. Um, if you vaguely understood what I said, or maybe or more likely you understood it before, what an atomic swap is, what is the disadvantage of doing an atomic swap uh, from a privacy perspective? Can you explain that? Anyone who is not an expert and is trying to learn. So, so wouldn't it be the amount and the timing correlation? Those are both valid points, but we'll get onto them more when we're trying to achieve privacy. Um, there's a more fundamental reason why a basic atomic swap, as I just described, is is poor for privacy. Also, the peers, I mean, they, need, they would need to communicate uh, the secret out of band, isn't it? Mm, they wouldn't need to communicate the secret out of band because the whole idea is that when one of them broadcasts the transaction with the hash pre-image, then it's on the blockchain and the other one can simply scan the blockchain to see it. I mean, it is actually the case that in practice you would communicate the secret out of band, um, but that's not the principal privacy issue with an atomic swap. Everybody sees your hash pre-image and can correlate them across chains. Yeah, that that would be the answer, right? Yeah, does everyone see that that crucial point? That I mean, you, you can generalize this point to just custom scripts generally. When when you use some kind of exotic script and not just a simple pay to public key hash or or the various equivalents, 
I mean, even multi-sig, right? Um, you're revealing something about your transactions. And this is like the ultimate extreme of that problem. Because here, we, if we just simply do a trade of one coin for another using the hash pre-image, you know, some string like hello or something, well, obviously, you, you'd use a more secure string than that as a hash pre-image. But um, then that string, that hash pre-image has to appear in both of the script sigs of the transactions that you're using to claim the coins. Just by definition, it has to if we do it in this simple way. So that unambiguously, absolutely unambiguously links those two uh, transactions on either one chain or on both blockchains. So that's terrible for privacy. And we'll go on to adapter signatures and PTRCs and this kind of stuff later. Um, the next item that I'll share is uh, Alex Bosworth's talk in London 2019. So this is interest. This is introducing a new concept where rather than swapping currencies on different chains, you're swapping uh, Bitcoin on chain for Bitcoin on the Lightning Network. Um, and so this is obviously useful in the context of submarine swaps and wanting to uh, change your inbound outbound capacity by making on-chain transactions. Does anyone want to talk about submarine swaps and how this differs from a, an atomic swap and, uh, that is swapping currencies uh, across different chains? Not seeing any hands. Nothing much says it makes sense to do coin swap first and lightning. Perhaps it does, but uh, I'll stick with this because we're kind of trying to stick with a timeline. Uh, and I think the discussion on submarine swaps was happening in a year or two ago, and there just wasn't the discussion on coin swap for privacy. I totally uh, disagree. I, I, I spent a lot of time really? in 2017 writing a, a library to do it, and we actually used it. And uh, you know, coin swap was always a very minor topic, right? Because right. Lightning, the paper I think came out, now correct me if I'm wrong, maybe early 2016 or early 2015, 2016. It doesn't matter. It was, it was a while ago, and it took a, obviously it took a long time to really get the ball rolling with Lightning. But during that period, there were a few, a few of us who, you know, you could see people occasionally getting a bit excited about CoinSwap uh, as an idea, as a privacy idea. But it was always a bit difficult to, like, get it off the ground. And perhaps we'll, we'll be able to discuss why that is at, at some point. Um, in this talk, but uh, I wouldn't say there's any sense in which coin swap is a thing that came after submarine swaps. It's quite quite the opposite. Um, mm. Yeah, and if I may, like the main innovation in uh, coin swap was the observation that you can do a cooperative multipath uh, spend uh, and keep the information off chain. And I think that was um, maybe my history is wrong here, but. I believe that was the main insight um, uh, that these kinds of things could happen off chain and you could have a, a binding set of transactions that uh, makes assurances to both parties without ever making it to the, uh, the blockchain uh, so long as both parties actually cooperate. And by having an incentive to create, uh, in this case, uh, fees, uh, that's how you actually uh, gain privacy. Uh, you, you, the, the hash pre-image is uh, never revealed if both parties um, actually follow through with the protocol. Yeah, I'm not sure about the the multi-path aspect. I mean, that's something that's there's been discussion about on various points. But but yeah, so, uh, almost uh, everything you said, I totally agree with. <laughs> uh, I don't. Sorry, I, I shouldn't have used that uh, word because uh, multi-path is uh, overloaded. I meant. Um, uh, in terms of the like the different uh, contingencies that may arise. Uh, oh yeah, I if, know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So perhaps we should just like uh, I'll okay. I'll let, you, I'll let you take it, Michael. No, okay. I, I've been overawed. It's fine. Uh, like the only reason why I said I, it felt like there was a lot more conversation going on around submarine swaps than coin swaps. Uh, and so, like the privacy wiki, Chris has like has a small section on it, 
but like when I was looking for resources on this, I was seeing very little discussion on CoinSwap. Perhaps it was just all being done like behind closed doors. Yeah, the public's imagination was captured principally, I think, by the concept of an atomic swap, especially in the middle of the kind of craze that we experienced from 2016 through 2018. Uh, mm. Partly because of all the altcoins, and everyone got very excited about how you could, you know, trade trustlessly and stuff like that. Uh, and then there, the whole obviously lightning exploded in some sense amongst a certain group of people, at least, between 2017 and 2018, when it actually went live on mainnet. And of course, Alex, you know, being the the fountain of incredible ideas that he is, <laughs> uh, pushed this uh, submarine swap idea, which is, you know, it's just another variant. But it's, it is fundamentally a slightly more complex variant of the various things we're discussing here. So, you know, educationally speaking, it might make more sense to go like atomic swap, uh, coin swap, and then and then talk about the more exotic things. Okay, let's do that then. Um, so let's go to coin swaps. Mm -hmm. um, so what links do I have? So should we go straight on to Chris's uh, Bitcoin Dev mailing list post, May 2020? Sure. Okay. There's there's nothing to say up until that point that you can recall. Well, like I say, I mean, I did actually write code and actually like build it <laughs> in 20. Okay. I, I should have. I, you should have uh, sent me links. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> see that when I was just scaring mm. the internet. Okay. Yeah. But, I mean, so, actually, actually, yeah. that repo. It's. Uh, I'll, I'll write it in the chat. It's. Um, Oops, that's not right. That's, a, that's some kind of keyboard shortcut. Um, what the hell just happened? No, I'll write it in the chat, but this this uh, repo is probably more in interesting for the issues list than for the code. The code is just, eh, you know, it's a thing. Um, that's on github.com, of course. I'm just giving you the username and the, and the repo name. But uh, we, we, you know, I, I spent some time, I can't remember when it was now, I went through Greg Maxwell's post in detail and it took me like, I think I remember it taking me like two days before I eventually realized that there was actually an error in what he wrote. But that's only important in as much as it let me write down what I thought it should be, what the protocol should be, um, which is what you have on your diagram. And which is basically, the basic idea is have the atomic swap and this was the idea. Obviously, this is Greg Maxwell's idea. Absolutely not mine. I'm just I'm just talking about making slight alterations. Have a have an atomic swap. So both parties have such an exotic script of the type I already described with a pay to a hash or to a or to a timeout or time lock. Uh, but then have this overlay, which is what nothing much was just describing. And this is a very important principle. We're seeing it in taproot we're seeing in you know all kinds of contracting ideas the idea is if the two parties cooperate then the conditions of the contract do not need to be exposed to the world instead you overlay on top of the contract completion a uh, simple direct payout from uh, a two of two multi-sig to whatever destination uh, and if anyone is still on that um uh meetup page and that, uh, looking at that diagram of course it's the transactions at the top uh tx4 and tx5 that pay from the two of two directly to carol and directly to alice's keys so what's what's my point uh i've forgotten what i was trying to say i was just trying to say yeah what was coin swap cs was me just thinking look i can i can just like actually concretely make uh, a code example of how you could have coin swap servers and coin swap clients, and this is perhaps something that we'll get onto in Chris Belcher's uh, some uh, like description recently. Is that the nature of coin swap? Is you know we talked about timeouts and we talked about how it depends on the the the, the, the sort of clock of the blockchain. It, it, the nature of it is that it's kind of a two-step protocol. It's it's fund fund the sort of uh, initial is initial initial funding phase and then when that's committed then you can build these contracts so you need to commit into shared control so in that specific version of the protocol alice pays into a two of two with alice and carol and and carol also pays into a two of two with alice, alice and carol after of course having pre-agreed transactions that spend out of it just like uh, many of these contracting systems so, um, yeah, so I, I basically I just coded that up where I had Carol as like a server 
and Alice would be querying Carol and saying, look, can I do a coin swap of this, this amount? Then they arrange the transactions and then they, they set it up. But it's a two-phase thing. So just fundamentally, it's kind of more, um, more interactive than, than, um, than something like a coin join where, where you're just preparing and arranging a single transaction or, or more importantly, a single phase. Because as, as I explained in CoinJoin XT, it could be multiple transactions, but it's still a single negotiation phase in CoinJoin. Whereas coin, coin swap, it, it's, it's a lot more powerful of a technique because what you end up with, history is not being merged, but history is being completely disconnected. But the trade-off is you have like cross-block interactivity is the way I put it. And also you have to, and part of that cross-block interactivity is you have to trust the blockchain not to reorg, which means you have to wait not just like 10 minutes, but you have to wait quite a long time between these phases of interactivity. Um, yeah, I should also mention, I I've actually feel, I'm starting to feel kind of bad about this because I'm promoting myself and it, it's kind of crappy, but I, I'm going to write in... Uh, one of three blog posts I've actually, that, that one was uh, nearly three years ago now. And that was just basically how coin swaps work, the different types of them. And then later blog posts, I talked about the, you know, the Schnorr variants and so on. But it's, but it's all about that basic concept that you have the atomic swap, then you overlay it with a, with, because you're using multi-sigs, you can overlay it with just a direct spend out to the two parties so that what appears on chain is not a hash or anything. It just looks like an ordinary payment but it's you know multi-sig, and this is something that Chris Felcher has uh, tried to address in his write-up. Um, sorry, there is a bit of a brain dump at this point. I'll, I'll, I've been talking too much. I'll, I'll be quiet. So I'm just trying to think like some of the issues to tee up the discussion of Chris's proposal. So I mean, there's a few interesting things here. Uh, one is this uh, tweak. This is this the 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 bug you found in Greg's initial design that I'm sharing here, Adam. I'm not seeing a share, a screen share. I'm not. Um, I'm not seeing a screen share. No. Uh, Is there anyone else? Or let me stop and then try again. Uh, can people see my screen or not? Can someone say yes or no. No, no, cannot see your screen. Uh, maybe I'll put the video on. Maybe put, yeah, try putting the video on, see what happens. Yeah, might might help. Yeah, your audio is absolutely perfect when the video is off. <laughs> but it's, uh, it went a bit crazy before that. Can people see my screen now? No, I can't. No. No. This is my... uh, uh, so in that link you shared, Adam... Which uh, link? The, the the coin swap CS get ah yeah okay let me pull that up yeah coin swap CS yeah so in that there's a doc in the docs directory there's a coin yeah. swap underscore tweak dot md yes that was that was me explaining what the problem was with the original post yeah but it's all very like in the weeds that I wouldn't worry about it you know it's details okay that's annoying my screen shares are working yeah that's um, good. and then your blog post you talk about some problems that i'm assuming chris would have had to have addressed as well like one of them was malleability is yeah, that but, an issue we should discuss now or not well not really because that was solved with segwit so oh okay Very nice. yeah this, this was at the time this was just around the time of activation actually so we were trying to figure out whether we needed to address non-segwit or not and it was all rather hairy much like Lightning, you know how it is in Lightning. Like they were saying at the time. Yeah, okay. remember, it's exactly, exactly the same concept. More or less the same. It, I think exactly the same thing, yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, okay, so we'll go on to Chris's, unless you have anything else to add. I, I, I apologize for not just finding these resources in advance. So. No, I think it is pretty <laughs> obscure. I don't think many people know about this stuff, yeah. Okay. The, whole topic, the whole topic was kind of obscure, really. Yeah. Okay, so let's go on to Chris's mailing list post then. Yeah. Uh, and I'll try once again to share my screen, but I don't think it's going to be working, I'm afraid. People can't see my screen now. Uh, yeah, I think we can see your screen. Oh, you can yeah, now? Yeah. yeah, it's working. Oh, it's weird. It must be a Jitsi bomb. Okay, so this is 
Chris's mailing list posts uh, May of this year, and then there's the gist uh, with more details on the design. Uh, so, so, so I suppose Adam, you're the natural person to go to. But anybody else? Has anybody else uh, gone through Chris's design? Uh, have any thoughts or want to explain it? I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, so maybe Adam, you could explain how this proposal differs from like the work you we were going through back uh, that you worked on back in 2017. Oh sure, yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't just me in twenty. I mean, you could go back as far as like twenty fifteen. Adlai, Chandra Sekhar, Chris Belcher were were quite enthusiastic about CoinSwap back then, and I, I was a little bit, and I became more interested over time. But uh, what, how is this different from what what goes before? Well, it, it isn't really. It's just really a very much fuller fleshing out of some of the key ideas. Um, so a couple of things that he's added into the mix here. I mean, obviously it's a long, a long post and it has several ideas, but maybe one of the most important one is the, which we would, again, we were discussing this two, three years ago, uh, but using ECDSA two party. Um, so what that means is that trying to do, because we need to use multi-sig, but we don't really want to, um, we don't really want to use ordinary multi-sig. And, and the, the thinking behind this is a bit, it's a bit subtle, really, because um, if you think about it this way, when you do a coin join uh, in the current forms like Wasabi, Join Market, Samurai, etc., uh, you're doing you're doing a completely non-steganographic, if I could put it like that, a non-steganographic um, uh, protocol. In other words, you're not hiding that you are doing the protocol, which means that the anonymity set of the participants in this privacy protocol is you know sort of transparently the 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 set of participants at least at the pseudonym level that that went in you know the the specific set of addresses or what have you that, that went into the protocol but when you move to a more uh, or when you at least try to move to a more steganographic um privacy or or hiding protocol in other words um with something like coin swap you at least are hoping uh, oh no yeah coin swap specifically not atomic swaps but with coin swap specifically you're hoping to not make it obvious that you've done that uh, because, you know, as has been discussed at great length in the context of pay join and other things, that there's a huge uh, benefit if we can achieve the goal of having uh, any one of these protocols be, as I put it, steganographic because it could share a huge anonymity set rather than just some limited one. Now, in order to, if you actually want to achieve that goal with CoinSwap, the, the, just the very first step is to do what we've described in the last 15, 20 minutes. In other words, <clears throat> use an overlay contracting system such that the outputs in the cooperative case, at least, are not um, exposing things like hash pre-images or other custom scripts. So at the very least, you want the outputs to be, let's say, two of two multisigs. But the reason he's uh, mentioning and expounding on ECDSA two party here, he's talking about specifically the scheme of uh, Yehuda Lindell and other people where you use ex somewhat exotic cryptography such as the Pallier crypto system uh, in order to achieve the goal of having what is effectively a two of two multi-sig inside a single ECDSA key. And so if you, if you achieve that goal, then you are going to create such a coin swap protocol in which all of the uh, transactions, at least crudely, at, at least at this level, look like existing single key ECDSA keys, which is basically all the keys we have today apart from a few multisigs here and there, right? Uh, do stop me if I'm just blethering on. Do stop me if, I, if there's a question or something. So then I guess the thing that has changed since... 2013 is first of all we got csv so time locks are way better second of all we got lindell's two-party ecdsa protocol um and his mp ecdsa protocol which uses uh doesn't use pallier it uses um elgamal instead which is more compatible uh, with yeah. the curbs anyway both are good for this different security assumptions but um 
And then the third thing, which I'm not sure is, is used here, is adapter signatures. So, right. you know, as we're going to talk about point time lock contracts here in a minute, but that hash pre-image reveal is de-anonymizing by itself, right? Mm -hmm. And so with adapter signatures, which you can do with both Schnorr and ECDSA, you can reveal that pre-image in a manner that only the recipient can find it. Yeah. 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 That's very, very good points, I would say. And this is... this. This is the ECDSA two-party section in Chris's design. Yeah, he kind of like doesn't talk about uh, it at all. That gets, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it uses Mandel's proposal. And this is to have a two of two multi-sig with only one signature going on chain before we get Schnorr. So it's space savings on chain as well as like the adapter signature property of uh, like superior privacy of not having that script telling the world exactly what is going on. That's right. And the price you pay for that is essentially more rounds of communication between the sender and receiver. Um, there are some zero knowledge proofs that need to be communicated. Um, and, I, and I'm not quite sure what the number count of the number of rounds is. I th it's at least three. Um, but you know, for off-chain payment protocol, that's not that big of a deal. Um, and in fact, if you look at Musig and Schnorr, you have a similar number of rounds of the protocol anyway, because uh, they have to decide upon the nonce for a Schnorr signature, for a group source Schnorr signature. So, um, yeah, good point. Let's go to nothing much. Um, so, to a, a paper by Malta Moser and Reiner Bohm uh, called um, Anonymous Alone, which is an attempt to uh, kind of quantify these, uh, what they call second generation uh anonymity techniques on bitcoin and it contains uh just an interesting bit of data about uh, like an upper bound for how many coin swaps um could be going on uh it's only an upper bound under the assumption that um multi-sigs that coexist and are of uh, a similar amount um that that coincide in time on the blockchain uh, like any pair of those is potentially a coin swap. So that's how they quantify the anonymity set. And I, I think that that uh, kind of gives an intuition for uh, basically all of the the main ideas that Belcher uh, proposed. Uh, so this is the multi-party ECDSA stuff uh, that makes the uh, scripts less distinguishable. Uh, it's the introduction of uh, routing, uh, which makes... Um, uh, means that it's not necessarily just a two-party arrangement. Uh, and the uh, splitting of amounts uh, into multiple transactions so that the on-chain amounts are, are decorrelated. Um. Yeah, did I, did I understand you correctly? You're saying that because, because of that paper, they were making an assumption that multi-sig is... Is going to be a fingerprint of coin swaps, and this removes that uh, fingerprint. Well, that's one aspect of what you said, is it? Yeah. So, I mean, that paper tried to quantify how many uh, users of privacy techniques uh, are there. Um, it addresses yeah. uh, coin joins, it addresses stealth addresses, and it addresses coin swaps. And for coin swaps, um, uh, they say that, I mean, because the data is off chain, all they can really do is a given upper bound for how much uh, coin swapping is actually occurring under some uh, fairly strong assumptions. Uh, yeah. So the first of these is that any coin swap is going to be anchored uh, into uh, two scripts uh, that coincide. Um, so like two UTXOs that uh, coincide in time, uh, which are, uh, right, I think, right. either two lot. of two or two of three, yeah. uh, and where the amounts are, are relatively close. Yep, yep, yep. That's clear. By the way, there's one aspect of all this that pet peeve of mine is, so Belcher's example, um, you know, has a Alice dividing at 15 Bitcoins into six plus seven plus uh, two or whatever else. Um, what we need to do in, in order to get this is we need to be doing binary decompositions of value, right? 16 million Satoshis plus 8 million Satoshis. And using a binary decomposition, you can get any value you want. And each set of binary decompositions then becomes its own anonymity set. And that's the best you can possibly do as far as anonymity set. But if everybody's dividing their value arbitrarily um, down to the Satoshi, right, you have a very, very strong fingerprint. You even have a very strong ability to correlate because if I ask a question, 
well, how many pairs of outputs on the blockchain can I sum to get a third uh, output on the blockchain and say, aha, well, maybe these two are actually engaged in, in a coin swap. Uh, that, you know, the ability to do that is still extremely strong. Mm. Um, it's, I, that's a very good point. That's a very, I'm glad you, you raised it. Um, I, I would slightly make the argument that with two types of fees, and I'm thinking of the joy market scenario here, it isn't necessarily as easy as you might think to, because you tend to get a lot of false positives. But I think your fundamental point is almost certainly correct. And I, I'm glad you, you said that because I'm really going to pay attention to that from now on. <laughs> this is a, sorry, but a bit of a digression, but mm -hmm. um, uh, exactly the, the kind of intuition um, that uh, I've been so I, I've been thinking about like what I've been calling preferred value series stuff. I think it generalizes to more than just a uh, binary uh, to any like minimum Hamming weight uh, amount. It could be decimal as well. It could be decimal with a preferred value series. Uh, but the, the intuition there is that if you have a smaller set of amounts uh, that you can uh, combine together to create arbitrary amounts, then um, like the likelihood uh, that those amounts will have an anonymity set or are much larger. Uh, the issues with that are uh, obviously the uh, just the, um, I mean, if you need uh, a UTXO for every significant bit in your amount, and let's say the, the average Hamming weight of an amount is like five significant mm. uh, digits or something, right. like that, uh, then you create a substantial overhead. Mm. Um, and we haven't um, uh, shared anything yet because as a group, we haven't uh, like uh, come to consensus about that or even like started. But for the uh, unrelated stuff about Wabi Sabi uh, mm -hmm. and coin joins, um, this is definitely the approach that I have in mind, and I'm I'm very happy to share. Like I, I think there's um, like uh, finally that there's a way to kind of make it uh, practical uh, huh. without uh, necessarily having that. Um, uh, problem of of uh, this is like substantial, like let's say five x or ten x uh, uh, UTXO bloat factor. Um, hmm. There's so, definitely uh, a a bloat factor there. The way this is handled in traditional markets is, um, you know, if you go try and buy certain kinds of stocks, you can only buy stocks in lots of uh, one hundred um, shares, right? And you know, on the foreign exchange market, it's in lots of one hundred thousand um, dollars. So I, I envision that you know, if a trading market were to arise in this manner, uh, there would be a lot, a minimum lot size, which would be significantly larger than the dust limit. I mean, you're obviously not going to go down to the Satoshi because I can't make a, a single Satoshi output because you can't spend it and that's below the dust limit. So, uh, you know, something like 8 million Satoshis, 16 million Satoshis would probably end up being the minimum lot size. And then you do binary decomposition above that. So the, um, again, apologies that this is a bit of a question, uh, but uh, like the, the the reason I'm I'm bringing it up, so the the transaction structure that I have in mind, and bear in mind I'm only speaking for myself here, not for Nopara or Ishtan, uh, is uh, the coin joins where uh, you have um, uh, different mixing pools for those Hemingway one amount, so like every power of two, um, uh, that occur as parts of like larger coin join transactions. So you can imagine sort of perfect coin join uh, that has a, a nice um, like switching network topology. Um, and uh, there would be representative inputs and outputs of every such class. Um, and, and if you have a coin join transaction that's constructed in this way, um, then in theory, this gives you uh, um, a sort of like a blinding factor for all of the other arbitrary amounts because every possible amount, um, this is based on the, the knapsack papers, like definitions of a, a non-derived subtransaction. It's the idea of like how many different ways are there of combining, uh, assuming that all of the inputs and outputs are self spends inside of a coin join and, and page join breaks this heuristic, but, um, Assuming that, like, if you do the, like, what's called the, the Sudoku attack, where you yeah. uh, kind of constrain things and find partitions of the transaction that balance to zero, um, the the idea there is that um, you always have ambiguity in that case, because every possible amount could be uh, an arbitrary composition of those, like, coin join 
uh, elements that have that power of two. And I'm really sorry about like this massive digression, but the kind of the reason I'm bringing it up is I think it's really relevant for this case because a big problem with uh, um, coin swap coordination in general is that uh, like if two users are swapping history, um, then one of them in theory gets a tainted history, unless there's a sort of like common understanding that taint is no longer a valid assumption. Um, then like there may be a disincentive for people to offer uh, swaps, because if you don't know the provenance of the coin that you're swapping against, maybe uh, you lose fungibility in that transaction. Um, but in this case, like if there are coin joints that allow um, the creation of uh, fungible uh, values of arbitrary amounts, and you can do a, a coin swap where one part, like one side of the coin swap is an output from such a coin join, uh, I think that that creates a very complementary uh, sort of on-chain uh, scenario where um, l users can uh, swap arbitrary amounts uh, without um, having a very strongly identifiable um, uh, footprint. Anyway, sorry that, that this is uh, a That's bit absolutely right. And that, that's something that concerns me greatly about these coin swap proposals is that it's, it's literally a swap. So I'm going to give you my UTXO, you're going to give me yours. Um, some of the other proposals, uh, state chains have the same property where I'm going to get a new UTXO. You know, if there's a pool of UTXOs out there and one of them came from a dark net and is blacklisted somehow, somebody is going to get that UTXO. They're going to get the full UTXO, right? And it's going to be a bad one. This is a pretty strong disincentive to use such a system. Um, whereas with a coin join, I have, you know, 100 inputs and 100 outputs, and I don't know which is which. And so each one is tainted 1%. Whereas with the swap proposal, one UTXO that somebody is going to get, and it might be you, is tainted at 100% level, and the others are not tainted at all. Yeah, I had exactly the same thought. Um, like, let, let's say you've got completely clean Bitcoin straight from being mined versus Bitcoin that has been through, uh, I don't know, an identified uh, drug and terrorist mixer. Like, you're not going to be too happy swapping those two. Um, unless, unless, unless as soon as you get your Bitcoin, you do loads and loads of transactions to yourself so that you beat the the like taint score or the taint measure that people like exchanges use? I don't think that's robust because um, it's pretty easy to do modular decomposition of graphs and you, you can identify a strongly connected component that originates from uh, like a small set of outputs. Um, and it, it like, even if it's a larger graph, it's still uh, equivalent to a single transaction, basically, in that case, um, uh, unless you're act actively mixing with other users' history, uh, I don't think that approach really buys you much in terms of privacy. It may, it may be a very effective way to get past uh, uh, simplistic heuristics of uh, exchanges, um, but I, I, I would uh, caution against actually uh, thinking about that as a, like a privacy-enhancing technique. Yeah, I'm talking about the coin swap being the privacy technique. But let's say, like, you've got the short straw and you've gone into a coin swap and then you've got these, like, uh, tainted and in inverted commas Bitcoin. You then need to get them untainted uh, for if, if you want to go into an exchange or you, you want to use a merchant that has certain restrictions on which Bitcoin they'll accept. So the, the, that process of untainting, it, it seems like a very, um, like, I, I think it works today just because the heuristic exchanges use are uh, very crude. Um, and they're only doing this as a cost-saving measure to reduce liability anyway. Uh, so, uh, like, if this becomes more common, then all they have to do is slightly ramp up the computational difficulty of identifying, uh, like, these graphs of self-spans or whatever, um, and it's it's not a difficult problem to uh, identify those because the subgraphs are disjoint. Uh, if if there's no uh, just connecting it to the like the rest of the the transaction graph, uh, it, it's fairly easy to isolate. Um. Okay, let's let me just go through some of the YouTube comments because I haven't. Uh... I uh, haven't gone through the YouTube comments so far. 
So uh, Shinebius Monk says, I demand uh, an immediate in-depth comment from everyone on how to deal with the timing issues of successive coin swaps hitting chain in a short time period. Anyone want to take that one? Did, did, did you say the timing issues of successive co coin, coin swaps in a short time period? Is that what he said? Hello? Oh. Adam, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, did, did, did the I comment? No, you... uh, is that is that case it is? Yeah, I'll read it again. So Shinobius Max says, I demand, it might be a joke. Yeah, a joke? sure. sure. It might be obviously a joke. I demand an immediate in depth comment from everyone on how to deal with the timing issues of successive coin swaps hitting chain in a short time period. Yeah, I didn't understand. So is this the... just a comment on like it, like filling up blocks with too many coin swaps? I don't well, know. I, 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 he's got I, a tongue emoji afterwards. So it might be, it might be a joke. Sure. So, so sure. I think what, what he says is that coin swaps can be identified if they are hitting the chain in very short uh, time period and maybe the amount can be correlated. But then, you know, how, how do you know that those are coin swaps? I don't know. Maybe there are ways to, to guess. Well, it's difficult to yeah, know. I mean, is he, is he talking about? Some, yeah, go for it. Is it, if, if he's talking about timing, timing correlation, or maybe he's talking about? I mean, yeah, I, I guess, I guess what what Adam just said makes makes the most sense. That that's what he's actually asking about timing correlation. Um, well, I mean, this I think this relates back to something that I was thinking we should definitely discuss, which is. What are the practicality issues around coin swap? I mean, I think people should take note of an interesting historical fact that in late 2013, uh, Greg Maxwell made two very similar long Bitcoin talk posts, one called CoinJoin and one called CoinSwap. And I think CoinJoin was implemented in some form or another within like one month of the CoinJoin post. But when I looked at it in tw early 2017, <laughs> Four years later, basically nobody had implemented CoinSwap at all. Um, and it's still, we, to this, still to this day, it's not a huge protocol. Uh, and, but, but my because there was a coin join bounty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, that wasn't my reason, but okay, maybe. But my, my, I don't think so. I think actually that, that, that fundamentally, and CoinSwap is a more powerful protocol, but there are some practicality issues that we should start discussing, uh, assuming that is that everyone on the call now kind of understands what our coin swap is. I, I, I would hope people have got a pretty good general idea by now. Oh, sorry, we were going through the document. I forgot. We were going... <laughs> let me just, uh, let me also just go through the YouTube comments because I've been yeah. ignoring YouTube. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was Shinobius. Uh, please, Carol, if you if you didn't get your question answered, Shinobius, please uh, clarify what your question was. Uh, Shinobius also says you arguably don't get you arguably don't get atomicity in the sense of state guarantees across two different uh, proof of work chains. Um, and I'm assuming that's because if there's a reorg on a chain or both chains, I, I think that's his point there. Yeah, probably. It's because definitely relative worse. difference. Of seconds. Yeah, it's it's definitely worse because you're dealing with two clocks, and it's just a bit of a it's even more messy, or well, significantly more messy. But yeah, I, I, it's kind of the same basic problem, I guess. Hmm. I suppose maybe there's a lot more. Well, there is a lot more reorgs on other chains with less proof of work. So that depends true. how how uh, shit your shitcoin is. <laughs> Uh, then Josh Smith has blockchain space and in inverted commas. So yeah, there's a blockchain space issue here potentially, uh, yeah, but which is but, 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 mitigated but by having one signature on chain, the ECDSA two P or yeah, yeah, yeah. But but but, sure. but but think about it. I mean, it depends on what you're comparing it to, right? Because think about it in comparison to CoinJoin as a privacy technology. It's just fundamentally a lot more. Uh, fungibility per byte on chain. I mean, it's difficult to quantify, but it must be because, principally because this, not principally, but partly because of this steganographic thing that, you know, what is your anonymity set if you do a 
50 party coin join, you could say, well, my anonymity set is 50. But what's your anonymity set if you do a coin swap properly, such that nobody even knows it's a coin swap? Well, it's either a lot or it's kind of like you can't define it, right? So it's pretty efficient, which is one of the main reasons that people like Chris Belcher and myself and many other people were, were very, always very interested in coin swap, even if we thought it was quite difficult to implement. Furthermore, it has uh, like a positive sum type interaction. When you coin swap, yep. uh, you're also helping the privacy of every non coin swapped uh, output that has the same script type. Yep. Yep. Same thing we discussed in PayJoin, the same dynamic. Yeah. Okay. And then I think Alistair got the HTLC problem question correct. Uh, and then last thing from Shinobius, Belcher's idea of routing amounts through successive coin swaps and the impracticality of staggering the time between individual transactions in the chain of coin swaps for intervals that are too long. So this is successive coin swaps. So, I mean, yes, but I think the next topic should be these routed coin swaps that mm -hmm. Chris talks about. But yeah. uh, Oh, sorry, this is Shinobis is just saying that was a clarification for this first question. So I suppose having too many successive coin swaps and staggering the time, in, like let's say there's an overlap between one coin swap that you're engaging in and the next coin swap. Hmm. Uh, any thoughts on that? Otherwise, I think we should go on to routed coin swaps. Uh, kind of related, isn't it? Yeah. So let me try and share my screen. I don't know if it will work. Let's see. Uh, yep, it's working. Awesome. So routed coin swaps. So the problem that I understand this is addressing is that if I do a coin swap with Adam, and Adam's a malicious party, he's a, a chain surveillance company, then I'm basically just telling Adam what my history is, uh, which isn't ideal from a privacy perspective. But if you have this like circle where everyone's doing coin swaps with each other, and there's multiple parties. You're now, you you now have to worry about all of them colluding rather than just engaging in a a swap with one malicious party. Is that correct? Anyone have thoughts on that? Um, just in terms of the problem that's addressing. Okay. So then, how does this routed coin swap work? Uh, does anybody want to go into details? There's the multi-transaction routing diagram here. Uh, unless anybody else wants to go, should we go to Adam? There's two Adams on the call now. <laughs> oh, sorry. This, this is getting confusing. Uh, what, I'll call you the wax thing. Then. Yeah, I'm just going to say... Uh, as I said at the start of the call, there is that hand signal at the bottom left of the screen. So. So I, by default, I'll, I'll go to some of the experts, but please uh, participate whenever you want. And it doesn't matter if you don't know, you don't, you get it wrong. But yeah, go for it. Once. So I think it's not, I think we can believe that that, that, that assumption is correct. It's, uh, it's a more important thing to explore that, how, how that assumption changes other properties of coin swaps, if it changes at all. Wait, what? What was what question were you answering? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was saying that uh, there is there is a problem with two of two coin swaps because the other person learns learns the history, mm. uh, and 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 he was asking that how how does how does the solution work. And I said it might be more interesting question to explore if we just accept that the solution works. But what what does that change in coin swaps? Like, does it ruin the user experience? Uh, does it does it does it do something else other than just just fixes that problem? Is it harder to implement? I'm, yeah, I'm getting a bit lost, Michael. What's where, what are we? So, so this so routed coin swaps. Uh, oh. I tried. I tried. I don't know if I did a good job. I tried to explain what the problem is, 
Um, and then the question is, well, how does this routed coin swap work? Uh, and then Adam additionally said, uh, does this introduce any implementation problems or any user experience problems if you do a routed coin swap rather than just a two-party coin swap between me and you, right? So, yeah, so I think essentially, I mean, I have to be clear, I haven't thought about this much. I mean, I think um, Chris, Chris first started talking this on about one of the issues on the on the coin swap CS repo some, a couple of years ago. And um, I remember both him talking about this and multi-transaction. Um, this addressing a privacy problem, it just seems to me very much like we're just looking at exactly what we see in Lightning Network here, right? We're, we're, I mean, it's not literally exactly the same, but we're looking at almost exactly the same mechanic right so we've got, we're going to have we're going to have staggered timeouts to make sure that no party is ever in a position where they could they could lose sort of on both ends of the trade so to speak and um yeah it addresses a privacy problem in that same way where every participant in the route or the route um doesn't know for sure like the originator i think that's a correct statement so, well, as you can tell, I'm just thinking out loud. I haven't really thought about this very much. Maybe somebody else has. Um, the general principle's clear enough. Nothing guess, much to talk about everything. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed, yeah. So I'm hoping, yeah. <laughs> so a couple, I think it'd be useful go to go over the... Um, I guess the privacy issues with Lightning first, as it stands today, with yeah. HLCs. Um, uh, so, like the, uh, if we assume that the routing is only a problem for coin swap uh, makers, uh, much like the public Lightning graph is uh, not considered to be a privacy issue. Um, when you do a routed a payment, you're making an HTLC with the first party in the route uh, mm -hmm. and giving them an incentive to enter an HTLC with the next party. Mm -hmm. But along the entire path, even though anonymity is guaranteed, uh, everybody shares the same secret. And uh, we mentioned it earlier, uh, the uh, PTLCs as a solution to this. Yes, uh, there's also mm -hmm. anonymous multi-hop locks and a bunch of other approaches. But um, if, if I'm not mistaken, in Belcher's, uh, I, I think he doesn't go into detail about how routing is supposed to work, but mm. the implication is that it uses adapter signatures. Oh, okay. Um, and so anonymous multi-hop locks is actually the same thing. I mean, that was that uses points yeah. specifically to achieve the security proof to avoid the wormhole attack. But but of course, it has other <laughs> excellent properties. Um, yeah. So anyway, I was. But there are a couple uh, of I'm, key. Sorry, go for it. Go for well, it. I, I was like, I'm. I'm not a hundred percent on the details. Uh, hopefully, maybe Adam uh, can can step in to explain how you can do uh, how you can use um, uh, uh, adapter signatures to create something that's equivalent to a whole route uh, sharing the same uh, pre-image um, without. Um, uh, without that secret actually being shared by all parties. Um, okay, but you okay, so you're just talking about the general idea of point time lock contracts, right? N now? Because in, in the anon anonymous multi hop, hop lock paper, it's a terrible name that I can't, anonymous multi hop lock paper, uh, they basically explain how you can essentially have um, a tweak to the, to the, um, to the, to the nonce essentially. Uh, at every at every hop, such that uh, like every party sort of subtracts one num has has their own single secret, and it's kind of added added along the path, so that everyone gets the same guarantee as they would if everyone just used one secret. But actually, each person's secret is different. Um, you know, using the linearity of Schnorr. Um, Maybe that's a terrible explanation, but 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 generally you can just think of it as using the linearity of Schnorr to make it so that we're not all using the same hash pre-image. We're all using something like a hash pre-image that's kind of locked together, but each each of our numbers is actually different. Um, uh, and anyway, anyway, what, what what are we saying here? Hang on, I'm getting a bit confused. There's several different moving parts here. We talk about adapter signatures. So are we talking about using coin swap of the type 
that was initially proposed, like as far as I know, by Andrew Polster, and I wrote it up in that blog post, flipping the flip, uh, flipping the script with script on Schnorr, where we're talking about using an adapter signature to effect a coin swap, so that instead of worrying about oh the hash pre images are all on chain, so somebody could connect them, or two two people two, two transactions, somebody could connect them, but because the equivalent of a hash pre image is actually sort of embedded inside the nonce in this adapter signature. It means that nobody sees it anyway. And it means that we don't need this kind of overlay protocol. We can make an, a much simpler kind of coin swap. So are we doing that kind of thing across multiple hops, but we're using ECDSA adapter signatures? Is that what we're doing? Um, it's complicated. I, I don't know that adapter signatures are required or used here. My understanding um, of Belcher's proposal was actually that Alice, who is um, doing the coin swap, is actually mediating multiple coin swaps at the same time. And two of the people she's mediating, like Bob and Charlie, uh, meeting in the coin swaps with, Bob doesn't know Charlie exists. Um, and that was my understanding, that it's centrally routed around Alice, as opposed to like the linear chain that happens. Oh, no, no, but, but I think so there's Correct me if I'm wrong. But I think there's two parts. If you read it, there's there's a multi-transaction part uh, where Alice kind of parallelizes, and I think that's what you're talking about, right? And then there's a routing or routing part. He talks about them in two separate sections. Uh, and then he talks about combining multi-transaction and routing it, it together. So he talks about the, the, the headings are not that clear. Yeah, you've got routing coin swaps to avoid a single point of trust. Then you've got combining multi-transactions with oh yeah so first it's multi-transaction coin swaps to avoid amount correlation that makes sense and in that uh oh, that's, that's just alice and bob but making multiple coin swaps between those two parties then there's routing coin swaps and there it does show an actual chain alice bob charlie dave dennis um so alice's input and output there and then finally it talks about combining multi-transaction with routing and then you have kind of both right i see so yeah between alice and bob they have multi-transaction and between bob and charlie they have multi-transaction and so on and so on so it's both effects that are being talked about and in terms of adaptive signatures you're right that i just did a search he's only talking about adaptive signatures in this document in in connection with succinct atomic swap um which so that's like further but that's i don't think he's including that in the proposal so you would have um, different hash pre-images in each of the hops along a route here because we're not trying to... Right, so that's fundamentally different from Lightning if what I'm saying is true, isn't it? I didn't, and I've just never thought about this before. Yeah, but you could make a route with... Please, please jump in, anyone who understands this better. You know, you could make a route with... But it's not a route, is it? It's, it's like a circle like from Alice to Bob to Charlie and then back to Alice. Yeah, but it's, it, not, it's not like a lightning payment where I'm trying yeah. to get it to a destination. Sure, and there's sure. a bunch of intermediaries helping me get it to that destination. It's like a bunch of participants no, I don't in agree. like almost like a ring sing signature. Like no, somewhere. no. I understand what you're saying, but I don't agree. I think, but I don't think it's fundamental okay. that Alice is sending to Alice in that example. I don't think that's fundamental because okay. think of it as Alice's source and Alice's destination. If her destination happens to be something that she owns, then than it is, but that's not fundamental to what's going on. I mean, it's like. Could you start say that again? We couldn't hear it. I think that's Bob. Is it? Um, it says fellow jits. So I, I I couldn't hear. It was very quiet. Yeah, I couldn't hear it. It was a bit quiet. Whoever that is. Nope, wasn't me. Okay. Um. So you could, let me think about this. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering what to go on to next. Uh, there's a question in the YouTube, uh, again, Shinobius, uh, isn't the idea to chain the transactions together without signing, submitting the first funding for the routed coin swap? That's what I inferred from the proposal. Yeah, I think you, you guys must be right. I don't know. I was just having a bit of a brain fart. It must be, the whole thing must be atomic, mustn't it? But then if that's the case, then 
Yeah, of course, yeah. So we're still in the situation where only in the cooperative case would we have proper privacy. So, in, so perhaps that that it reveals that we have sort of extra, uh, what's the word, um, extra fragility here if we have multiple participants. Because you already have the concern when you do a single coin swap between two participants that if the other guy doesn't respond in time, you're going to have to publish onto the blockchain and it's going to be it's going to be obvious that you did a coin swap and you, you, you maybe didn't want that. So I'm, I'm a bit worried that if you have a lot of participants, then obviously the potential for, for at least one party to somehow, but I suppose that might only affect that hop, right? If you had, a, if you had four hops and one of the, the guy that's like third along drops out and doesn't respond, then maybe two of the four hops end up broadcasting the hashed chain. I'm just thinking out loud here. I wish somebody could <laughs> put me out of my I misery and explain it. <laughs> so parties could, in that case, choose to still uh, settle cooperatively, mm -hmm. but the entire route may learn. So uh, suppose Alice sends to mm -hmm. Bob, who sends to Carol. Carol mm -hmm. sends the final payment, uh, and then Carol defects and reveals uh, the hash lock. Yeah. Uh, this is why I mistakenly assumed earlier uh, Chris was uh, uh, relying on adapter signatures. Um, in that case, uh, uh, Bob uh, will still learn um, where Alice's mind went, whereas in the uh, optimal case, uh, Bob mm -hmm. has no idea where sure. the final payment is sent. He only knows that he's sending to Carol. Yeah, so I think okay. So I think we all kind of generally agree the idea there. And indeed, mentioning adapter signatures makes a lot of sense because because it does take away that problem. So then there's the question of uh, whether, in an ECDSA context, given recent work by Lloyd Fournier, uh, those kind of single signer ECDSA. Things might work. Oh no, hang on. Can we do? We can do adapter signatures with. Can we with ECDSA to that that Lindell thing? Uh, yeah, I believe that's possible. And uh, Lloyd's work is specific to uh, single signer ECDSA. Yeah, single so signer. Yeah. yeah, so you wouldn't have the privacy that um, that yeah, Belcher wants. Yep. So yeah, I mean. Ruben, take it away since you're here. Just give us all the details. <laughs> I know I, I, I came in a little late, so I, I'm here. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm kind of catching up on what you're talking about, so I, I can't really uh, fill in the holes right now. But if you have any questions you think I know about, like I know a bit about uh, adapter signatures and stuff, um, just very generally speaking, I think my intuition would be if you have a multi-party protocol, it's going to be either like Lightning, where you yeah. have you know A depends on B depends on C, or you're going to have uh, the um, the protocol that you um, wrote up, the, what was it called, S6 or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I, I think you'd need to use one of either in order to make it work. That, that's my intuition, at least. Um, I'm a bit lost. What? what, what... Can you go through that again? What what is it? You th what are we? Can you just go through that again? I didn't get it. Yeah. So I well, I'm not sure how relevant it is to what you're talking about because mm. I just I just came in, so I'm not sure mm. if I'm fully caught up. Uh, but just very generally speaking, it seems like you're talking about Belcher's uh, atomic swap oh, yes. Sorry, uh, yeah. write up, and yeah. there are protocols, or you know, he, he basically writes up a bunch of variations uh, on uh -huh. how to do uh, coin swaps. Yeah, and I think if you're gonna do a coin swap with more than just one counterparty, mm -hmm. then you're gonna have either uh, some kind of lightning. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so either yeah. it's gonna be like a, a chain, or yeah. it's gonna be a big network of every all all sort of connected. Well, actually, you know, the thing about that S six six thing is, I don't know how significant it really was in the end because ultimately it is kind of a chain anyway. It, well, never mind. Let's not get involved in all that. That's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> So, but that, so that will be adapter signatures, right? So that will be a way to do it with adapter signatures. But yeah, so I think the point that me and nothing much were sort of arriving at was that uh, obviously, if you're going to do um, this kind of uh, on chain, uh, oh God, this is an unfortunate word, an on chain chain of swaps. So if you think about it, like Lightning uses off chain chains of swaps, HTLCs. So here we're doing an on-chain chain of swaps. So I was just, we were just sort of realizing that, well, if there's one link in the chain, 
the the defects it's kind of unfortunate because it at least generally it's going to be revealing information on chain and obviously you get that with two parties but then the risk is much lower whereas if you have like six parties the risk gets higher and higher so if you were to use adapters it has that uh, i mean certainly the in the form that i wrote up as at the schnorr uh, thing the upholsterers thing then it would it would avoid that problem because you don't have the defection problem in in the adapter signature coin swap because the you know the pre-image is, is embedded in the nonce yeah um, i agree with that so any any third party wouldn't be able to figure yeah. out what the uh what the pre-image is yeah so if 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 he's going to go to to using ecdsa two-party which explicitly the proposal is to do that which makes a hell of a lot of sense because it shares the anonymity set then maybe maybe sort of wedge in adapter signatures even if it's like a weird ecdsa variant of adapter signatures um wedge it in somehow also if that's possible yeah i, I believe it's compatible with 2p ecdsa i, I haven't gone through Definitely that is. myself okay. okay that's good yeah. and Great. uh i mean very generally speaking i think it makes sense to use adapter signatures because even in the uh, you know non-cooperative case you're gonna end up with less block space usage so why not if it's possible yeah Okay, so we talked about routing. What about multi-transaction? Does that make sense to everyone as well? Because that's the other key part of the architecture. Let's just quickly let's quickly go to Shinobi because Shinobi's been waiting for ages. Let's go to Shinobi. You there, Shinobi? All right, can you Shinobi? guys hear me? Yep. 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 Go for it. All right, so you guys have me wondering now if I just completely misread um the entire section on like routing through multiple transactions in belcher's proposal now um <clears throat> what i took away from uh the the write-up on github was that you effectively just have the taker coordinating between multiple makers with these intermediary utxos um that are two-party ecdsa addresses and you you just coordinate that route um get all the things um to the end of it signed and then you sign and fund it air quote uh to compare it to lightning and that's either a binary um you know it succeeds or fails just based on the the two-party ecdsa preventing anything conflicting from being signed and you could even enforce a staggering delay of chain or hitting the chain with uh, the unlock time field. Well, no, doesn't every party have to create a funding transaction? So the original proposal had four total transactions. As I, as I understand it, Belch's proposal has two transactions total per swap or one transaction per party. So I think that means that in the routing network, there's one funding transaction per entity. Um, and then you have to close it out. So this this whole routing network is not off chain like Lightning is. Somebody correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong there. Yeah. It's all on chain. Yeah. I believe that's correct. Um, and in this regard, the difference between Lightning and this kind of goes away. In Lightning, the secrets, the pre-images are shared appear to peer, but the route is done by the sender. Uh, and uh -huh, here, because yeah. everybody is sharing a broadcast network, i.e. The, the blockchain itself, uh, the parties along the route don't actually have to communicate with each other directly like they do in Lightning. Uh, everything is uh, mediated by uh, Alice. Was you, oh, wow, this is confusing. And what, what, uh, so you're saying, so you're saying that Alice is going to basically. No, I don't quite get it. What's the mechanism here? Alice tells everyone. Alice must be choosing the the set of uh, participants. Yes. Yeah. That's also true of Lightning. That's also true of Lightning. The, so source routing. Yeah. The difference is uh, in this scenario because everything is uh, um, on, like there, there there isn't the off chain aspect and mm -hmm. uh, Bob and Carol. Uh, are not in some sort of long-term arrangement between them. Oh, the right, yeah. Channel. Well, that's true. Um, the the only situation where they need to actually coordinate with each other is in case the payment doesn't go through, and then they have the blockchain for that because uh, it's on-chain. Oh, I see. That's a good... It's a, yeah, it's a small point, but that's true. Yeah, they don't actually have to... Uh, yeah. Huh. Well, so, so as I understand it, I mean, the original proposal had four transactions, right? Alice is going to swap with Bob. 
both Allison and Bob have to create a funding transaction. Yeah. At the end of the swap, they have an exit transaction where yep. they, they retrieve to their wallet, right? So that's four total transactions. Um, using the notion that Chris Belcher talked about of uh, swapping private keys, where it's effectively a two of two multi-sig, and at the end of the process, I'm going to give you one of the two private keys, and you already had the other one. Oh, but hang so on. now you're Bob has about... unilateral control I and doesn't need to exit on chain. Yeah, but I think you're talking about succinct atomic swaps now, aren't you, which is Ruben yes, Thompson's yes. thing. That's right. I, I thought sure that was just Chris like a suggest- as well. Sure, I know he talks about it, but I thought that was just like a suggested. Uh, Ruben must know. R- Ruben. Yeah. Has- so, so there are there are kind of two things about the succinct atomic swap, and and the thing that you're talking about now is actually possible with regular atomic swaps as well, where you do the swap, and then you oh. just, you don't broadcast the final transaction. You just give each other your your key uh, yeah. off the uh, uh, off the the funding transaction. And the the problem that you have then is that it becomes kind of there's still this refund transaction that becomes valid after some period of time, uh, but it yeah. allows you to direct the uh, the outputs towards whatever you want before that time lock expires. Um, so you would well, have but you're, yeah you're still going to have to exit on chain. So we're still talking four total transactions here. You can delay the the final exit, but I. Correct me if I'm wrong. I cannot reuse that commitment transaction for another swap. If if Alice and Bob set up the two commitment transactions that has to be executed or canceled, and if I want to swap with Charlie, I, I need to create a new commitment transaction involving Charlie's key. Yeah, but the point there is that that's not you know that's that's another funding transaction, right? So so you go yeah. from funding transaction to funding transaction, and you skip the settlement phase because you have full okay. control over the UTXL, mm-hmm. and, and then you start funding again. Um, so as long as you react before that time lock expires, before the refund transaction becomes valid, you can direct the funds anywhere you want, including another swap. And that's kind of the basic premise where if you have some kind of server that does a lot of swapping or you have a lot of, you want to swap a bunch of times, then you do not have uh, two transactions. You only have one transaction per swap. And then atomic, yep. uh, succinct atomic swaps are kind of a separate thing uh, where you don't have the time lock on one of the two uh, uh, outputs that you're swapping, and that gives you some additional, uh, you know, uh, benefits because then that one basically doesn't expire. Mm. Okay, so amortized worst case scenario, um, there are four transactions per swap. Best case scenario, two transactions per atomic swap. Uh, well, the worst case is that your swap doesn't go through, right? So if your swap doesn't go through, yeah, it's probably also four transactions. Yeah, that's yeah still four, I think. Yeah. I was really hoping this was doing swaps off chain. Uh, but that brings up the interesting question, which is raised in the document, which is, you know, how does this compare with Lightning? You know, what, what, shouldn't we just use Lightning? And, and he, he talks about several angles to that. Maybe, maybe do you think, Michael, it's a good topic to talk about, comparison with Lightning? or? Uh, yeah, we could do. Uh, I do want to move on to succinct atomic swaps in a bit. Uh, so if we can try and keep discussion of succinct atomic swaps until that section. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but anybody yeah, uh, anybody who wants to talk about the differences between Lightning and Chris's scheme, go for it. Yeah, I mean, let's assume there are multiple Lightning networks here, one on Litecoin, one on Bitcoin, and I can swap between those two. Isn't that far superior? And I don't think anybody's actually really done that, except in small experiments. Yeah, but this isn't attempting to replace uh, cross-blockchain uh, uh, swapping or trading. This is attempting to replace, or is attempting to provide a new functionality for privacy in Bitcoin. Uh, but I mean, the question of like, why don't we just use Lightning? I think it's a very good one. But I, I think it is, a, to be fair, it is addressed specifically in a whole section in the in the document, right? How are Coin Swap and Lightning Network different? Um, so I think if I if I just like summarize what I read here, uh, there was a very interesting point. The, the first point that he raises for his first like advocacy for this approach really surprised me. It wasn't like the first one I would think of, which is coin swap can be adopted unilaterally and is on chain. And he's pointing out that in a world where, let's say, your your friendly local uh, Bitcoin exchange or or similar company. Uh, decides not to adopt lightning and you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs getting annoyed with them 
uh, he points out, well, this can be done today and doesn't require anybody's permission. Because if you can make payments via either a coin swap or some complex chain or, or route of coin swaps, if you can make a payment using such a technology, then uh, you don't need the permission of the recipient of the payment. So it's a very interesting point to really lead with, I think. But he does make uh, a couple of other points um, about liquidity and size. I mean, one of the reasons when I was looking at this in 2017 and writing code for it, and I was thinking, you know, is it really worth looking into this as a separate technology, considering Lightning, you know, in 2017 was being developed quite actively and was almost ready for, for prime time. And I was thinking, well, it may only have a small role, but it might have a role simply because uh, it might be able to support larger sizes. Um, it could be like a more heavy protocol for actually... Um, obviously, it doesn't have the same advantages as an actual off-chain protocol, but it but it allows it creates a, a privacy effect similar to what Lightning does, uh, but perhaps a very large payment. So that's another thing. Um, he also talks about civil resistance, and he's talking about fidelity bonds there, which is something I know a lot of people will under, understand that he's something he worked on recently. We we recently merged that code into Join Market, although it isn't active yet. Uh, the idea of you know fighting civil attacks with with fidelity bonds is interesting. Well, I'm not sure. I haven't thought that through in the in the context of coin swap. How it's different. Um, anyway, there's just a couple of points. He he makes like two or three arguments as to why it's still an interesting thing, even though Lightning exists. Hmm. I don't I don't I don't buy his argument that um, that it's on chain is good, right? I, I, mm. I think on chain payments are dead. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we should not be using them. We should be using Lightning everywhere. And it's going you know, to take time for the market to adopt that. But uh, on the on argument that somebody's still using BitPay from, you know, 2014 is not a good argument. Yeah, yeah. But 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 on-chain consumer payments, I would almost, into, almost, but certainly not entirely, but I would almost completely agree with you, are dead uh, and, and are not a particularly interesting thing. But they, they exist in small pockets. That's fine. But uh, Bitcoin is not just consumer payments. So what, one thing I want to add here is that I, I think it's just very fundamentally different where with Lightning, you have a channel and you still have to open that channel. And when you're opening it, it's clear, it, it, you know, it won't, won't be clear that after you close the channel, how much of that money is going to be yours. But it's clear that that's a UTXO that you are controlling. So you still need, before you open the Lightning channel, you still need some kind of privacy. and at the very least, swapping into a Lightning channel or something along those lines uh, seems useful to me. So I think I think it is it is orthogonal in a sense, and there there does seem to be a use case, even if Lightning becomes amazing and perfect and everybody uses only Lightning. Uh, I think it still helps with privacy in in the sense that you still have some on chain footprint. Yeah, that's another point. Yeah, I would go further. It's not just orthogonal; it's also composable. Uh, this is exactly why I thought uh, it's better to wait uh, to bring up submarine swaps, because that's exactly the yeah. the use case uh, where you're still swapping on Bitcoin, but you're swapping between an on-chain and an off-chain uh, uh, balance. Mm. Yeah, it, it would be very so nice. To be Go on. Go on. So to be clear, Chris Boucher's, Chris Boucher's design is fully on-chain. Uh, yeah. Everything is hitting the chain, and the only the only part of that document which Adam was discussing is dis is comparing it to Lightning. And so Chris is Chris is saying, well, there's just not enough liquidity on Lightning. If you want to do large amounts, Lightning's just not up to the job, and perhaps never will be for large amounts. Um, that's a complete. That's a very valid everything argument. is on chain in Chris's design. That's a very valid argument in that um, Lightning also forces you to put your your keys online to a certain extent. Uh, and so, you know, maybe very useful for retail payments, but is not going to be useful for high volume traders, right? Um, yeah. Does this have the property that it lets, it, it gives you better properties as far as keeping your keys offline than Lightning does? And I think it does. Well, it's it's kind of a sliding scale, isn't it, really? I mean, I think it does, yeah, but it's also the case that you don't just... It's not a set it in... Well, no, yeah, okay, fair enough. Yeah, you you could do this entirely with a hardware wallet, for example. Uh, well, not necessarily. I mean, the the two PE CDSA has multiple rounds of communication, which oh, is material, <laughs> right? Yeah, good point. So it's going to make you put your keys online too. Well, unless anyway, 
these differences are not fundamental though. Uh, no. I mean, it's a, it's a spectrum of design choices and implementation choices and uh, a function of the adoption. So mm -hmm. um, like, I, I, I think it's, it's difficult to kind of speculate uh, in our current van vantage point in the, in the present about, you know, whether lightning is going to have liquidity issues in uh, two, three years time or something like that. Um, anyway, that's, but if we, if we are to now move on to submarine swaps, as you suggest, nothing much. Um, I mean, uh, I don't think we have time to, to talk about this, to talk about submarine swaps too much. Um, but when you're swapping Bitcoin on chain for Bitcoin on Lightning, then the liquidity issue really comes into to play, right? Because you, you can expect it to be a large amount on chain and a smaller amount on Lightning. Yet if you're doing it for privacy reasons, that amount needs to be the same. And so amounts that make sense economically to be transferred on chain aren't necessarily going to be the same amounts that are being transferred on Lightning. Yeah. Um, so this, like, what I can sort of see in, like, in my mind, um, in a sort of ideal future is uh, people having access to coin joins to a coin swaps to lightning with a public as well as private channels for various different purposes. And depending on your threat model per payment, you can choose your desired level of finality, your desired level of uh, hot wallet security, your desired level of privacy, etc. cetera. Um, but none of these trade-offs are fundamental to any of these technologies. And in principle, like it's more of a question of implementation Right now, it's very impractical to say that you have fluidity uh, with these things. But like we, we can envisage a sort of uh, a situation where uh, you have a sort of uh, smart wallet that uh, has only watching keys and kind of manages your funds. And then uh, uh, if you're going to make a very small payment, it might make it via lightning. Whereas if you're going to make a large payment against a party that you don't trust, it's going to do an on-chain coin swap. Uh, to benefit, uh, like, g give you stronger counter privacy uh, and stronger finality. Um, and also lets you move your balance between uh, a hot wallet and a cold wallet or something like that. And an entire spectrum is, um, in principle, available. It's just a matter of uh, actually implementing that. And Shinobi and Ruben are discussing in the chat submarine swaps plus state chains. I don't think we have time to go into state chains. Uh, nah, that, that seems like a whole other topic. Maybe maybe next time if you guys want. <laughs> <laughs> can, can we can we address like the serious practical question? I think it's already been raised a little bit, but like no, coin swaps are an idea that's pretty old. What is going to be like the motivation? I think we could all agree that it could like really improve um fungibility and, uh, and privacy and, and you know whether whether lightning is better than it or not is not really the issue because at the end of the day we have to do transactions on chain anyway so we need some kind of we need to try and like pay attention to how we're going to make them so but the, the question is like it was raised earlier like you know some people are going to say oh i don't want to do a coin swap because i might get like a, a dirty utxo or something and and there's that and then there's like it's a pain i mean you've got to sit around and wait what well, you're going to wait 100 blocks i mean nobody wants to wait 100 blocks to do anything at all so it's not like there are serious where's that, where that 100 block where's that 100 i just block made that up i just made that up the okay. point is that you have to be safe from reorgs with this whereas you don't with an ordinary payment um but in, in practice bitcoin doesn't have too many reorgs more than a block or two right so yeah, maybe that, that applies I mean, to shit coins, but for Bitcoin, that's that's not a problem. Well, if you're paying for a house, how many how many confirmations? You know, do you know what I mean? Like if it's a large amount, and we are largely talking about larger amounts here. So maybe it isn't 100 blocks. Maybe that's ridiculous, but I don't know. Maybe it's 50, but whatever. My point is there is this like this cross block interactivity. I'm, I'm just setting aside all the complexity involved in things like ECDSA two party, uh, you know, multi sig, which is which is a very exotic construction. Um, you know. What are the what is the practical reality here? Is this going to get implemented, and how are we going to get people to use it? Is a market mechanism an important part of getting people to use it? Because, for example, it, that might overcome people's concern, saying, "Oh, that's a dirty UTXO." If there's a market incentive to accept a in quotes dirty UTXO, maybe it flips the the whole the whole.
perception and maybe everyone thinks well i'm not even going to look at people's i don't know do you see where i'm going with this i'm like what's the actual practicality here what do people think is it is it going to happen i mean that, uh, that incentive that incentive question sounds just the same as join market doesn't it, it well yeah like I think a hideous problem he mentions it in the in the document as i recall yeah let's uh let's try and get reuben involved more let's create reuben's on the call uh firstly yeah. again my screen oh, sharing on. isn't I, working hang on michael i was okay. asking a question i was hoping somebody <laughs> would answer i was oh. asking a very impassioned detailed question about okay. this topic. yeah I, I think that that would be good to answer it first okay yeah. let's okay well Go can i hop in real quick um, yes yes adam i think that coin swaps have a, a lot of potential synergy with coin joins in the sense of a way to maintain individual anonymity post um, coin join with those UTXOs as they fragment. And then eventually you could just hoover them back into a coin join and just kind of repeat like a synergistic cycle between the two. Because, you know, it really is like after a coin join you have to be vigilant with that or you start undoing the the whole um gains from the coin join yeah i'm not super familiar with that but i i believe the the change outputs in a coin join or the amount that it isn't exactly the same as everybody else's that that is kind of the that becomes kind of like a tainted utxl that you cannot spend together with your coin joint coins right so maybe for that change amount, it would make sense to do a coin swap or something along those lines. Yeah, I mean that, but I mean also just in a general sense of a, a way to further disconnect um, your post coin join spending activity. Because I mean, even keeping things isolated, trying to do things like pay joins, like eventually things are gonna narrow themselves out in a long enough time horizon. And coin swap is a like just another post mix tool potentially in that situation. Okay, okay, that's an interesting answer, but I think I'm not sure it really answers my my point. Right. I think, I think yeah. you're describing how uh, you know that that's a whole interesting area of discussion of how you can make even more powerful constructions. But I'm asking about practicality. I'm asking about will people do this, and what are the vectors to decide whether we we will end up getting people doing this or not. I mean, I don't. I don't like as the number of parties increases, the the the, the chances of it of it not of of it failing. Uh, I mean, you have the same dynamic on Lightning, where the more hops you have on your route, the more the more chance that one of those hops isn't going to work, and so your, yeah. your payment's going to fail. But this is even worse because, at least in, in Lightning, all the intermediaries are basically playing the role of a routing node, and most routing nodes know what they're supposed to be doing. But in this sense, it's kind of creating a, a privacy scheme where like people don't really know what they're doing and someone could just drop out and make the whole uh, coin fail. So as the parties increase, I, I, I can't see this being a, a, a good scheme. Well, I, I have a, 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 a different answer. Uh, you might mm -hmm. not like it though, uh, Adam. <laughs> um, maybe people selling tainted coins on the dark yeah. market um to people with clean coins who want to patronize dark markets hmm. yeah but that's just a variety of that whole uh market like he, he he has a section called liquidity market here and um it's just a it's just another a flip side of what i think it might have been bob said earlier about you know well what if what if I participate in a coin swap and I'm just doing a normal person doing it in a normal way and I, I end up with, with a direct 100% history, 100% taint to some criminal activity? I think it's a very valid question because the point he was making was with, when you do coin joins, you don't get this binary, either it's totally uh, you know, a criminal coin or it's, or it's not, you get this like 1% taint or 2% taint or whatever, which is more something people can stomach more easily, perhaps. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, what's the word ideological about this. And I just, you know, fuck, fuck everyone who thinks taint is a thing, you know, but most people are not like me and they're, can they, they actually want to like, I don't know, like feed their family or something weird like that <laughs> so yeah. they so they, you know what i mean so it is a concern actually in practice in reality whether whether we have this kind of fragility or, or this kind of binary taint problem 
But isn't the goal kind of to make it so that everybody's coins are tainted, essentially? And yes, so, absolutely. So basically, the heuristic needs to break where you are yeah. paying someone with a, like you said, 100% tainted coin, according to some heuristic. Mm. But then it's not a 100% tainted coin because you're not involved with that, right? So yeah. I, I think it kind of, uh, it's that um, we need enough people to do this in order for the heuristic to break. So this can no longer be kind of a reliable way of uh, doing business. And, you know, one thing that uh, I'm thinking of here, like uh, more to your question is if we have things like pay swap where mm. you're paying a merchant and simultaneously you're you're doing a swap. Mm. And then if the merchant receives some tainted coins or something and they yeah. want to go to an exchange with those tainted coins, well, you know, what do you expect? Like, like either we have this whole... Uh, you know, blacklist system where, or, or whitelist system where you only take the coins that some uh, authority said, okay, these are clean and everybody checks off the list uh, or it just becomes unmanageable. So I, I, I hope it becomes unmanageable, but I, I do agree to your point that I do agree that it's a, uh, it, it's something that people are going to think about. Like, well, do I want to swap my coins if I'm going to, you know, if I have a reasonably okay coin and then i'm gonna get maybe some really bad coin from from the dark market or something uh, that that's definitely a concern and uh one thing i wanted to point uh like with shinobi's point like your point was that maybe we'll have you know the dark uh tainted coins and we have untainted coins and there's going to be like two of these markets I, I think that's a real disaster i think there needs to be some flow that allows those two to intermingle in a, in a way that's not uh, uh, traceable. Because if if you really have like two separate coins, clean ones and and black ones, that that that's going to be terrible. You know, we had a pretty good point with the coin swaps on coin joins. Uh, I think it makes it much more practical. It's uh, just just because you don't have to worry about the amounts anymore. That that that's a huge win there because you are doing on the equal amounts anyway and uh, on the other hand like what's the downside here uh the only downside i can see is that now you don't have this this accumulative effect of coin swap coin swap affecting all the transactions on the blockchain and 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 and, and i would argue that that wouldn't happen anyway because of wallet fingerprinting so coin join is some kind of wallet fingerprint and it still happens but only on the coin join outputs but uh, some somewhat on all the coin join outputs or something like that um, <laughs> and 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 i can imagine a future where there are very small coin joins uh very fast very rapid and and that just is good for 99 percent of the people but for those one percent who are the Edward Snowdens and Julian Assange's of this world, they might do a coin swap on, on those equal amounts, and, and 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 then like 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 all the everyone is 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 kind of happy. Like Grandma can use coin joins eh, with 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 very little user experience uh, <clears throat> drawbacks. So, so I think you know we had a very good point there. Yeah, I agree. I think the answer here is not either or, it's both, one way or another. Yeah. So I, I think the next interesting question is, what is the best way to combine these two? You know, can I, can I make my mm. commitment to a coin swap also be the input to a coin join or the output from a coin join be an input to a coin swap? I think that's kind of the next iteration of this set of ideas. It combines the best of both worlds. I, I think maybe an interesting model is, uh, um, you know, the coin join XT thing. What one of the things I had with it at that time is I was trying to figure out how do we address uh, amount correlation across multiple transactions. And if you, and I realized that you know if you had like a lightning channel open as one of the endpoints of a, let's think of a, a coin join XT as just like a multi-transaction coin join. But uh, it wouldn't have to be a lightning channel open. It could just as easily be a coin swap. Uh, I mean, I was thinking about that at the time. And you have that property that, you know, you... you... No, 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 that's, that's different, isn't it? Sorry, I'm quite wrong about that. So I withdraw everything I just said. And <laughs> let's go back to Bob's point, which is that what's the best way to combine um, coin swap and coin join together? I'm finding this quite confusing, actually. Well, there, I guess there are three total concepts here, right? You've got coin joins, coin swaps, and lightning channel openings and closes, right? Yeah. And... 
in principle, any of those three could be any of the other three, right? The output of a coin join could be a lightning opening, could be a, a swap, um, and I should be able to compose these things. And mm -hmm. the extent to which we're successful in creating a protocol which kind of naturally composes those three things and picks mm -hmm. which one is best for the, the best circumstance and increases the anonymity set of all three while decreasing the taint of all three as well, that's kind of the ideal case, right? Yes. This, so which, um, which should come first? Coin swap or coin join, which which makes more sense. Chicken away. Well, we already have coin join and lightning, right? So coin swap. <laughs> well, I, I like the argument of uh, coin joining first and then using the result in a coin swap. Uh, that that seems pretty good in the sense that you do have some anonymity already. So whoever receives that that uh, UTXO is not going to receive a fully tainted UTXO. It's already mixed with with other coin joins. There's uh, just for complete, uh, completeness, uh, so uh, submarine swaps also bridge the gap. I think that uh, mm -hmm. pertains to uh, Adam's point about uh, CoinJoin XT, where you can effectively have uh, a CoinJoin transaction where one of the outputs is a submarine swap that moves some of the balance into a lightning channel, just like you can have um, a mm -hmm. uh, coin swap transaction either funded or settled through a CoinJoin. Um, and uh, an interesting post uh, from the Bitcoin Dev mailing list uh, recently is, uh, or two posts is uh, are about um, batch coin swaps, uh, where you have a, a single counterparty uh, as a maker uh, servicing multiple um, uh, takers uh, coin swaps uh, simultaneously, which uh, again kind of blurs the boundary uh, between uh, coin joins and coin swaps. Mm. Yeah, but what are the uh, one of the things okay, I, was I do want to sorry, Adam, Adam, sorry. Adam, 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 I, I do want to finish in 15 minutes. Uh, okay. And we do have I do want to go over succinct atomic swaps with Ruben. And if Max is on the core, I'd quite like to go over the research Max has been doing. Uh, but we'll, let's try and finish in the next 15 minutes. But go for it, Adam. No, well, in that case, go, go ahead. I think you should you should do that then. Go, go to Ruben and Max. Go. You don't, want, you don't have the a last point, Adam? <laughs> I've said enough. I've got a lot of other things, but I've said, I've said enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's an obviously interesting conversation. I think we can easily talk for another hour here. But uh, so uh, I, I'm not sure exactly uh, to what degree you want me to cover it. Like I, I had a bunch of slides earlier today uh, for uh, the Sydney uh, uh, meetup, but I think I'll just do a kind of a talk through this time. Is that good or, or what do you think? If if you could focus specifically on the differences between like coin swap, Chris Batch's coin swap, and succinct atomic swaps, okay, like yeah. the, the specific differences, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so let's focus on that then. So um, the the main thing here is that with a, a regular atomic swap, you you kind of set up a a channel with Alice and Bob on on two sides, right, on the, on two UTXLs. And then you you share there's some kind of secrets, and then that one party can kind of take the coin from the other party and simultaneously reveal their secrets, and then that secret allows the other side to happen as well. And with succinct, succinct atomic swaps, uh, the secret revealing is kind of there are two secrets, and they're both inside of one UTXO. And the second UTXO is literally just a combination of those two secrets. So Alice has a secret, Bob has a secret. And depending on whether the, the first UTXO uh, goes to Alice uh, or gets refunded to Alice, and then Alice's secret is revealed, or Bob takes it and then Bob's secret is revealed, that, that determines basically who gets the uh, second UTXO. So either they both get refunded or they, they do the swap. Um, so this kind of creates this very asymmetric shape uh, where one side has basically all the transaction complexity, uh, which ideally, if uh, ever, everyone cooperates, is just a single transaction. But if, if people don't cooperate, it ends up being roughly three transactions. And on the other side, it literally is one transaction that just settles immediately as soon as um, the, uh, uh, the the time lock transactions on the uh, on the top side, basically. Um, have uh, completed. Um, so there are a few things I can say about this, but maybe um, you know I, I kind of rushed through the explanation. Is there anything I should clarify? 
So, so we discussed earlier on, I think perhaps you, went, you perhaps you joined afterwards, that the Chris Baptist coin swap, everything is going on chain. And so that's creating a, a cost and also uh, an impact on like block space. So one of the key differences between coin swap and six interatomic swaps is more stuff is going off chain and less needs to go on chain, right? You, 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 you cut it down yeah. to two transactions. Yeah. So, so cutting it down to two transactions uh, is basically like kind of what we discussed already. That's already possible in the original atomic swap as well. If you assume that either you're going to transact again before the time lock or you're trusting your counterparty kind of not to try to claim the refund. So there's always a refund transaction on, uh, on a regular atomic swap. And if you can set it up in such a way that it basically becomes like a lightning channel where if you try and claim the refund, there's still a, there's basically a relative time lock that starts ticking. And then if you respond before that relative time lock ends, uh, the, the refund can be kind of uh, canceled. So then you do the swap, then there's still the risk that somebody uh, or your counterparty goes in and tries to claim the refund. If they do so, you have to respond with yet another transaction. Uh, so the downside uh, to that is that it becomes uh, three transactions. So, so the worst case on the traditional atomic swaps would be that both sides try to claim the refund transaction. Um, I think that's probably possible. Yeah. And then you have to, if you want them to, if, if you want the channel to be open indefinitely, uh, at that point, uh, you would have to respond. And so then you could have a worst case of six on-chain transactions. So that seems pretty terrible. Uh, but that's one way of doing it if you want to do the traditional kind of style uh, and you want to make it two transactions only. Uh, and then you just assume that the refund transaction will never be attempted to be claimed. Uh, but with succinct atomic swaps, one side is literally settled. So one side is literally just, okay, once you learn a secret, the money is yours. Or if you taught uh, uh, your uh, the counterparty your secrets, then they have then they have that you think so. So it's one or the other, uh, and so you only have this uh, this kind of watchtower like transaction where you have to pay attention on one of the two sides, and that uh, basically cuts the worst case down there to uh, four transactions. Uh, so it's still not worse. Uh, it's basically either equiv equivalent to um, uh, to regular atomic swaps, or if you don't want to, the, the watchtower construction and you do want to settle, uh, then it's going to be three transactions. So it, it's it's kind of always um, basically it's it, it's superior in most most ways if what you're doing is just a regular swap, one person to another. Uh, but one thing I noticed is I, I tried to kind of puzzle with succinct atomic swaps and kind of multi swap protocols uh, or uh, even the um, what's it called, the half-blind uh, uh, atomic swap. I'm not sure if that's the name of uh, uh, Jonas Nick. Um, those protocols don't really seem to play well with succinct atomic swaps. So that's kind of the downside. So it, it depends on how fancy your atomic swap needs to be. But if it's just a one-on-one -on -one swap, basically I would say it seems like succinct atomic swaps are almost, all, all, almost always superior. Yeah, I as thought long was... as you've got that, as long as you've got that online requirement, right? So Chris, Chris's coin swap doesn't need the online requirement. Or no, the watch so our requirement. So no, no, it's uh, even without that, it's three transactions versus uh, four transactions. So even without the online requirements, it's still superior. And the the, the thing that Chris I think is doing is he's saying like let's swap and then let's swap again, and that way you only need. Uh, two transactions instead of four transactions, essentially. Uh, and, and that's true, but that's also true of sync dump swaps. So it kind of depends on what your use case is. If you're, if you're constantly swapping, uh, then it doesn't really ma matter. And then just only the final transaction, you might want to uh, consider doing succinct atomic swap because then at least one of the two parties doesn't have to close out uh, their, their swap session, so to speak. Um, but no, it, it seems to be pretty much superior uh, in, in, in most uh, other cases. Uh, a very minor And the correction. scheme that, yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't say Go it's a requirement much. to be online, 
Uh, rather, it's a choice, right? You you can choose to save on one transaction if you stay online. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, you don't have to, un which is not the case for Lightning. In Lightning, if there's a non-cooperative closed, you must stay online. Well, it would be like closing your Lightning channel, right? Like like you could choose to close your Lightning channel, I guess. So you don't have to be online. Uh, it, it's it's similar in that sense. Uh, but yeah, you have the option uh, to to close it out. No, I think I think nothing much is point is is pretty important there. I didn't I hadn't really thought about it right because because you have a punishment mechanism. There's there's a game theoretic aspect to uh, Lightning Channel which isn't doesn't exist in a in a pure atomic swap or coin swap, right? So uh, yeah, that's but, because that's because you're keeping your channel open for a long period of time, and in a swap, you're just doing one swap. You're not opening a swap channel. Yeah, because there aren't multiple states. You know, the, the whole idea is with off-chain, uh, that off-chain protocol is you you have to overwrite a previous state without going to the blockchain. So you use a punishment mechanism, whereas with, with it, in CoinSwap, we just use the, the blockchain always. So, so yeah, a different well, way. With succinct atomic swaps, you do, you do have that, you do have that uh, punishment-like yeah. mechanism. Yes. Yeah. Yes, which is which is the key point, actually. I think that's, I'm glad we raised it, yeah. It's a very, I was going to say, it's a very beautiful protocol. I was really impressed reading this thing, Ruben. It's just fantastic work. Thanks, uh, I'm glad you liked it. But um, that's, the, that's the crux of the matter, is that it does have a punishment mechanism, right, to achieve its goal. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, so uh, uh, Yuval, uh, nothing much is... Uh, um, uh, his, his point was that you can choose to just close it, and then it's a three transaction protocol. So it's kind of an optional thing, and 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 that optional thing of of doing the watchtower requirement is is kind of what I was trying to say, but maybe I was a little clunky in my explanation. That that there are basically two aspects, right? There there are two tricks. So one trick is kind of the asymmetric swap, where one transaction doesn't even need a time lock, so you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. And then the second trick is the watchtower requirement. And the watchtower requirements is, is kind of completely separate, right? Like I, I kind of put it together as kind of succinct atomic swaps, but you can you can you can transfer that watchtower requirement to regular atomic swaps as well. But then you have the watchtower requirement on both uh, UTXOs that you're swapping. Uh, does mm -hmm. that make sense? I think so. Yeah. I'll just go back and look at this again. Yeah. So yeah, you, you'll probably have to kind of work that out because in order to have some kind of watchtower re requirements, uh, you would have to have a um, kind of a, a yet another transaction. So so it ne there needs to be kind of a trigger transaction that starts uh, your claim to a refund. So you, you broadcast one transaction and then that basically signals, look, if you don't do anything, I'm going to get my refund. And then uh, the 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 party that is the rightful owner after the swap that's uh, basically if it's Alice and Bob, then maybe you know Bob has the UTXO that Alice first created, uh, and Alice can claim the refund. So then Bob has to kind of respond before Alice actually succeeds and claims a refund. And Ruben, you did briefly mention it. So this is so Jonas Nix. Uh, partially blind atomic swap using adapter signatures. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, what, what is this, what specifically does this have over just a normal uh, atomic swap using adapter signatures? Because with like PTLCs, you're getting the privacy in that this, you're not having a script on chain. So what additional privacy are you getting from this partially blind atomic swap? Uh, so partially blind atomic swaps is Basically, I think it's kind of already outdated because there's this other paper called, uh, God, I, I don't remember. It's like U2, U2L or something. I, I, I'm totally mispronouncing it. Uh, I think it's like A2L, isn't it? A2L. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, apparently, that's kind of uh, basically a better version of that uh, from what I'm told. Uh, but, but the very general idea is that you have one kind of par uh, party in the middle that facilitates swaps and so what you're doing is, you know, Alice, Bob, and Carol, they all propose a swap to the, 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 the server, let's say S. And then on the other side, the server doesn't really know if, if they're swapping with either Alice or Bob or Carol, uh, but, uh, but it's an atomic swap. So yeah. uh, the end result is kind of um, similar to a coin join, right? Like uh, a blind coin join, Tommy and coin join, but there is no uh, there's no single transaction on the blockchain, and instead you just see separate transactions uh, like one Bitcoin transfers or something. 
so that's that's kind of what that protocol is trying to do. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But Thank the, you. Yeah, but there, 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 so, yeah. there are two things that I think I, I should uh, mention about sync atomic swaps that might be of interest. So let me, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, but but one of the two is that uh, you can actually use uh, Musig on the uh, on one of the, the swap transactions, the one that doesn't require a time lock, because you're not actually ever spending from it. So it can be a single key uh, ECDSA, uh, just a regular uh, ECDSA Bitcoin single key UTXO, and you can do uh, succinct atomic swaps on that. Um, so, so that's that's for one of the two UTXOs, right? The one that requires the time locks and everything, where you reveal the secrets. You cannot do it. You would uh, you would need um, a two P ECDSA or something there. Uh, but on the other side, it can just be a single key uh, Musig, and you just basically reveal half of the key, and then uh, mm -hmm. that that's mm -hmm. sufficient. So that's kind of uh, very useful for privacy. And and the second thing that that does is because you're never really signing from it. It's very easy to create a transaction. Um, uh, how do I say this? So let's say if you want to fund that with a coin join, that's possible, and that's possible today. So, th so that will be a very interesting way of doing it, where you set up a succinct atomic swap, and then on one side you do the complex time lock transactions, and on the other side you fund it through a coin join. And normally you would kind of need to know the TX ID or something along those lines because you need to create a uh, transaction spending from it before uh, before you actually um, yeah. start the protocol. But that's not necessary here at all. So you can just fund it through a coin join or, or uh, something along those lines. Right. That's a very good point. Yeah, because usually we have to fund these two, yeah, symmetrically fund these two multisigs, yeah. And that's also uh, what Mac, Max is not here, right? Is Max in? Is Max in the chat? Because Max, can you say hi if you are? Hello, can you guys hear me? Still? Oh, awesome! Ma Max is. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Well, then yeah. I, I think uh, we should give a moment for Max to talk about his thing. Uh, that would be my suggestion, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Yes, I definitely agree. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen. It, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It appears. Uh, but can anyone see a screen? My screen. I've got Max's uh, no. research up. Uh, no, okay. Uh, okay. But so so Max has it's in the it's in the reading list the pace bin. So Max, oh, yeah. you have this research uh, exter externally funded succinct atomic swaps based on Ruben's succinct atomic swaps. Perhaps you could explain what your what use case you're uh, addressing here and how it works. Yes. So this, as you said, is basically utilizing uh, succinct atomic swaps. Um, with one tweak in the user experience, a very important one, and that will have consequences, it means that, um, or so to describe it, there's a client and a server relationship. The server coordinates mm. the swap and the client utilizes um, the, the swap. This is the first thing. However, the second aspect is um, that it might be that the user is coin swapping the coin that he's that he is receiving in the future so basically there's a setup transaction where the coordinator um commits bitcoin into a script a swap script um this is point time one um and later at point time two the user can um, send any Bitcoin to it from anywhere to a specific address um, that the coordinator can spend from. Um, the interesting part here is that this second transaction, which kind of um, uh, triggers the the swap out of the setup transaction, um, this this does not have to be from the user itself, um, which is very interesting. Um, in the original succinct atomic swap uh, graph, this was the Litecoin, um, uh, the, the Litecoin side of the chain, basically. Uh, this side does not have to speak the page, uh, the the coin swap proposal, uh, because it just 
sends to a regular address, uh, and that's it. Uh, and so here, a user or a different uh, person who pays the user in our context um, can do so directly into a coin swap address, which will mean on a high level UX level that the uh, that the user receives non-anonymous coins from anyone and instantly, as soon as he receives it, he gains access to funds um, out of a pay uh, coin swap, uh, which presumably have a lot of high anonymity. Um, therefore, we the user kind of buys on-chain privacy very, very quickly by swapping a coin, which has a lot of high privacy um, in any transaction that he receives the Bitcoin. Uh, is that somewhat clear? So maybe I can uh, give one example uh, that I, I, I'm kind of thinking of now that might clarify for people. Uh, obviously, I've talked to Max, so I, I kind of know what he's talking about, but I, I can imagine it's it's kind of complicated to to follow. Um, so the, the end result is that, for instance, what you could do is you could withdraw from an exchange and the, mo the money that the exchange is sending is actually funding a coin swap. So the address that the exchange is sending to is not actually where you're receiving the money because you're instantly swapping those coins. Uh, that would be kind of one uh, example of, of kind of what you're achieving, right, Max? Uh, yes, exactly. Um, this is the very nice thing about this aspect, because one side of the succinct swap is very stupid, basically. It's just a, a single key address uh, that anyone can fund. Um, this, this really makes it uh, easier in this sense. Um, there are two important downsides that we should uh, consider talking about. Um, the first is that the server needs to go first. Right? And this has financial implications. If this is uh, supposed to be a, a, a company or just a user um, seeking to be profitable, he will have to open a payment channel to a new user, which is most likely an anonymous Tor identity who has no reputation. Um, so therefore, it will be um, there's a denial of service risk um, in the sense that a fake user, uh, or a user, an, an attacker, creates multiple uh, identities uh, and lets the server open multiple um, channel or multiple swaps to the user, um, this malicious actor in this case, and this will be very capital intensive. Uh, so there's a need to figure out somehow how to make a fee uh, that will pay the service provider in advance when he is, when he's committing coins into the swap. Uh, what do you guys think? I mean, it, it seems like Lightning would be perfect for that now, where you, you basically send a payment to open a channel and you even pay for the adversarial closing of that channel. And then if the channel is not closed adversarially, you give a partial refund minus whatever fees you're charging. Yes, yes. Um, there is one more important thing to notice uh, that because the server goes first and a potentially third party external user is going to fund the pay uh, the coin swap, the tricky thing is the server does not know exactly how much Bitcoin the third party funder is going to send to the user, right? It might be any amount. It could be uh, 0.1 Bitcoin, it could be 10 Bitcoin. Um, the server does not know in advance, it's not in general, not specifically, the Satoshi amount. And this I, 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 I do think it depends on the example, though, because I think the example I just gave of uh, withdrawing from an exchange and then immediately swapping, uh, in that case, you would actually know how much uh, you're planning to withdraw ahead of time, right? So, so I guess it depends on, on what your use case is. Do, do you have a specific use case in mind where you're not certain how much money you're going to receive? Is it like a payment from, from a customer or what are you thinking about? Um, yes, I would even say that it might be a bit, well, in the, ex, in the case of the exchange, yes, you might figure it out, but at, at least the rough amount. But then again, it will change in nuances. How, how high will be the transaction fee and, and how much uh, will finally be in that output that, uh, that you get? Um, the, the, the example that I had, uh, was just, for example, Alice and Bob go to a restaurant and 
Ellis needs to pay back. Um, Bob knows that roughly, I don't know, uh, uh, 100,000 Satoshis will come on, but he doesn't know if it's 950 or 110, um, for example. Um, and th thus, he can do this. So it's, it's just, it's it's not exactly clear how many Bitcoin will be put into this thing. Mm, yeah. Uh, is uh which is actually very tricky um to to figure out uh, but but what do the what do you guys think is this actually a problem to not know how much uh bitcoin will be swapped in advance when knowing the setup you mean a problem for this uh for this third party this privacy expert um yes so I mean, the user too um but but yes i think it is mainly a problem for the service provider or for this swap partner well one thing i'm thinking is that you can cancel the swap if you're not satisfied with the amount and then before you're satisfied with the amount maybe you can do some kind of additional lightning channel Again, you know that makes it more complex uh, that you require the Lightning Network, but uh, a Lightning payment if the amount is not exactly what you were expecting, and then maybe you, you there's a little bit of a trust um, uh, factor there, um, or or you can maybe even make it so that the Lightning payment only goes through if the swap goes through. Uh, that should yeah, that should be possible, I think, um, because you know that also kind of relies on the secrets basically. Uh, so maybe you can kind of solve it like that, but obviously you, know, you get a lot of overhead of uh, trying to utilize the Lightning Network while doing a swap. So that may not be very practical, but that would be one way of doing it. Yeah, so I think it's it's an interesting approach. Um, what what Ruben and I somewhat figured out then uh, eventually was that if the amount is actually unknown, then what the service provider can do is instead of sending to a regular swap um, two of two multi-signature pre-signed or refund transaction all of this, instead of doing a regular swap address or script, um, he uses a payment channel, uh, which is which has the interesting aspect that, for example, if the user Alice somehow thinks that she will receive roughly um, under one Bitcoin, but roughly above. 0.5 Bitcoin, something like this. The service provider can open a payment channel of one Bitcoin to the user with all of the money on the side of the server. Uh, when then a external funder, for example, Carol comes along and pays Alice worth uh, 0.7 Bitcoin, uh, she pays this into an address uh, that the server can spend. Um, but only after uh, they negotiate a payment channel update uh, in that channel where now the user will have 0.7 and the server 0.3. Um, and I'm still not exactly sure if this actually works uh, to have a succinct atomic swap um, with that payment channel set up on one side. Um, because this changes the timeline a bit of the amounts uh, because there still needs to be one more payment channel update after the transaction is received from the third party funder. Um, so yeah, a bit of blabbering, but but what do you guys think? Uh, is this, this is my answer too. We will have to close pretty much uh, in a minute or two. Any last comments or any thoughts on, on Max's work? Yeah, so kind of to very briefly summarize, right, the, the idea is to basically allow somebody to make a payment and instead of receiving it on that address, you're actually receiving it on a coin swap and you're using that amount immediately to swap. And the other side of the swap can be a channel where every time you do a swap, you just kind of move a little bit of the balance of the, of the, of that essentially lightning channel to the other side. So, you can then kind of use that same channel for multiple swaps. So after maybe three payments are received, uh, now the channel is full and you you close the channel, something along those lines. 
Oh, yes, that's actually an important point. Um, making a payment uh, in the scheme as a user of that coin that was just swapped is basically closing the channel um, in, a, in the e cooperative closing transaction. And what one could do potentially, I'm still not sure, uh, is to do basically splicing, right? So you, you close the channel in one trend in the input, and then you open a channel again in the output of a transaction. Um, even better maybe would be to uh, swap some balances. If the user has two channels open to the, um, to the server, one smaller and one larger, then he could uh, swap the value of that is on the user side of the smaller channel into the larger channel with an atomic swap, basically just a lightning network routing channel update, um, and then close the smaller channel uh, in a way that there's no change. Um, so, I mean, there, as, as soon as the server and the client are online and can communicate, I think they can negotiate quite nice uh, swapping ceremonies um, altogether. Yeah, I and, believe I believe it's theoretically possible. And and the very nice thing with two uh, P ECDs A and adapter signature ECDs A, this all looks like single public keys, um, and nothing else in the cooperative cases, which is really 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 fantastic. Okay, very cool. Nice work, Max. Uh, we will we will close and finish up. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. Thank you for everyone watching on YouTube. Uh, right. The video will be the video is up. The, we'll get transcript up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Thanks. Bye bye.